Good morning and welcome to the Justice Committee's 23rd meeting of 2018. We have apologies from Jenny Gilruth and Liam McArthur, I believe um, you may have to leave the meeting at some point to uh, look at stage two amendments at another committee. Agenda item one is the declaration of interests uh, from our new and returning member, uh, Fulton McGregor. Welcome back to the committee, Fulton. Do you have any interests to declare? Thanks, Convener. I um, just want to say very glad to be back on the Justice Committee and I declare an interest as a registered social worker on the Triple SC. Thank you. Right, agenda item two is our first evidence session on post legislative scrutiny of the Police and Fire Reform Scotland Act 2012. The committee will take evidence in a round table format. Um, this is a more informal way of taking evidence and exploring the key issues in relation to this legislation, but it's, it's still a formal evidence session. And um, it does help, I think, just uh, rather than having set uh, pieces of evidence, it, it gives a better flow and it's a good start to any, um, any post-legislative scrutiny. Although, um, although it's informal, you still have to go through the chair. So if you want to catch my eye or the clerk's eye um, to indicate you want to speak, that's fine. You don't have to press any buzzers or um, any buttons as if by magic they'll come on. So I think we'll start by just going round the, the table introducing ourselves. I'm Margaret Mitchell and I'm convener of the Justice Committee. I'm Diane Barr, one of the clerks to the Justice Committee. I'm Stephen Emery, I'm the clerk of the Justice Committee. Hilton McGregor, MSP for Coatbridge and Crison. Ivor Marshall, Chief Superintendent from Police Scotland, but the President of the Association of Scottish Police Superintendents. John Finney, MSP Highlands and Islands. Elena Whittam, Interim Spokesperson for Causes Wellbeing Board and Deputy Leader of East Ayrshire Council. Hi, good morning. Mike Callaghan, COSLA Communities Team. Uh, Liam MacArthur, MSP for Orkney. Uh, Denise Christie, the Scottish Secretary for the Fire Brigade Union. Liam Kerr, MSP for the North East Region. Sandy Brindley, Chief Executive from Rape Crisis Scotland. Shona Robinson, MSP for Dundee City East. Uh, Nick Fife, Dundee University and Scottish Institute for Policing Research. Daniel Johnson, MSP for Edinburgh Southern. Rona Mackay, Deputy Convener of the Justice Committee. Thank you for that. And can I thank all the witnesses for um, giving us written submissions. That's really so helpful before we, we come to, to actually come into formal session that we've had the opportunity to look over these submissions. I refer members to paper one, which is a private paper, and we now move to questions. And Fulton, if you'd like to, to start off. Yeah, with thanks, Convener. Um, as a member, not, not around 2012 when the, the Act was first passed, there was a lot of talk about uh, the the, the financial reasons were the main reasons for reform. I'm just, I don't know who to, to go to in the panel first, so, so whoever wants to, but what was, what was the initial case for reform sound? Right, so I suppose we're looking at the very beginning and, and there were certain policy um, policy objectives and one of it was to, to protect, I think, services in uh, light of uh, financial threats. So was that a sound basis in, in retrospect? In, Whatever. Would anyone like to cut with that, Denise? Yeah, hi, thanks, Denise Christie. Um, the, the FBU um, at the start were uh, supportive of a single uh, Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. Um, unfortunately, the, this has amounted to a loss of over 700 frontline firefighters uh, and the closure of five operational fire control rooms, which impacts the most on women, because most women work in, in operational fire control rooms. Uh, so we believe that it's not impacted and supported the front line, and we believe that's because of the ongoing budget cuts that have been uh, put upon the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. We're also seeing regularly every day between 60 and 100 fire appliances unavailable to, 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 to go out to fire calls because we've not got enough crews to staff them all the time. So we, we supported the single service and we supported that because we believe that the, the Scottish Government's intention for protecting the front line uh, because there wouldn't be any duplications uh, and, and that was the direction that, that we wanted to go. But unfortunately, that's, that, that's not been the case. Okay. Any other comments in, on the financial? Yes, uh, Ivor Marshall. Um, 
I was around at that time and uh, there was a Significant work done in terms of the outline business case. Uh, I can't comment in terms of the, the due diligence that was applied around that, um, but there were obviously built within that expectations that there would be uh, ongoing savings as a consequence of the amalgamation of, of the precursor organisations, the eight forces and the two other agencies. Um, the reality of it, I think, has been that the service has been running with a structural deficit in its budget for the past five years, and I think that's widely known and reported that uh, the service has been trying to um, narrow that gap. Um, the money that was allocated to the services transformation budget um, was actually used to fill that and, and in some ways hasn't um, been used for transformation. I think the reality of the scale and complexity of the, the challenge um, was perhaps underestimated and the time scales around about that. So consequently, I think we're still you know, coming out of a phase of integration and consolidation and not really transformation. Um, the picture moving forward um, seems to be that we have a more stable um, budget platform, albeit we still have um, some significant challenges around about ICT development and transformation. Um, so I think in terms of scale and complexity, perhaps underestimated and the need to invest um, and create a bulge of resource that enables transformation before you can actually stabilize and have a national service going forward. Um, I think perhaps the, uh, the size and scale of the challenge um, that hadn't been attempted before, um, probably uh, with the benefit of hindsight and the learning that could come from this, would be that it needs significant investment to achieve that. Any other comments? Yes, Nick. Um, yes, I mean, I mean, although I mean the main driver for um, structural change here, you know, was was financial. It's quite interesting when you put this in a kind of international context, and and you look at what's been having it happening in places like Norway and and Sweden and the Netherlands, where they've also embarked on a very similar process of reform of policing, where they've merged. Um, what were previously autonomous regional forces or divisions and created a single structure. Um, and there the driver hasn't been money, it's been efficiency and effectiveness. So their view is that because of the changing nature of criminality and um, particularly around terrorism and organised crime, that actually having a single structure um, or an, and a more centralised structure offers um, certain economies of scale and certain uh, operational benefits in terms of being able to kind of mobilise specialist capacity to deal with some of these um, more complex forms of criminality. So, so you, you see a similar pattern of change, but not all driven by money. Right. Yeah. And in terms of the, um, has the financial imperatives, uh, have they been realised then? Do you have a view on that? Um, I mean... My sense is, and particularly, I suppose, from what the Audit Scotland have done, is that there's still lots of financial challenges around um, mm -hmm. reaping the benefits of, of reform. I mean, certainly there, there's been a lot of progress in terms of reducing duplication. Um, and um, I think, you know, one of the challenges during the, during the sort of first phases of reform is that um, Police Scotland were required to... Re you know, maintain the number of officers that they had at the outset, and that's one of their biggest um, costs. So in terms of realising financial benefits, and since they were quite constrained in, in terms of what they could do, because, because they had to maintain the numbers of officers. Um, they had. Okay. Uh, and uh, Elena. Um, thank you very much. Um, I think that local government is, is very aware of the need for transformation. We understand why um, that needs to happen. And I think that we have seen benefits. Um, so we've seen the benefits, as um, Nick has just said, about the reducing duplication. We've also been able to pull together specialised services um, more to a local level, which has been really good. Um, I think our concern as local government is that where budgets are being cut, um, you know, we are seeing um, difficulties um, at the front line there, but there has been and around a lot of positives um, as well coming out of the, of the single police okay. force. And fire. I think you raised a little bit there about uh, Ivor about maybe the complexity of of the change that that was required, and I know in some of the submissions that's been raised. Could, could you comment on that before we look at the time which Liam's going to to look at? Was the complexity of actually merging the forces underestimated? Um, my comment would, on that would be that, yeah, I think it probably was. Um, did we have the time scales and the experience and the expertise to be able to understand um, the scale of what it was? Probably not. Um, but with the best traditions of the service, we um, got on with it. 
um, and you know gradually, I suppose, learnt from some mistakes along the way around some of that. I think the the important thing now is, with five years into it, is to recognise that I think we've the service um, developed a, started to develop a ten year strategy now, um, which it didn't have at the start. Um, and we, as an association, support that, that there needs to be a sense of, of what that looks like and to have a roadmap going forward. I think the, the biggest challenge is around about that complexity is we've, there has been a focus rightly on structures and process and practice um, to keep the, the wheels on the wagon, so to speak, and keep going to calls and deal with that. Um, but perhaps at the expense of some of the organisational culture um, changes, the vision, the values, um, and harnessing the, the workforce, the people, and understanding um, that ultimately policing is a, a human endeavour and it relies upon the women and men who deliver that service to the citizens um, and, and, and has to be delivered through them. So it's about understanding them, supporting them, developing them um, with those structures and with the leadership uh, that, that's required within the service. Any other comments on, on that? I think you referred to it in your submission, Nick. Yes, yeah. yeah I, I mean, I, I, I think the complexity of, of the changes required was underestimated. And, and again, you know, Scotland's not peculiar uh, from that uh, point of view. You know, they, they face very similar challenges in, in other parts of the world where they've tried to undertake this kind of um, integration. And I think, as Ivor says, you know, it, it, it's one thing to, to change the structures. It's another thing to change the kind of culture that un, underpins that. And um, I think, in, certainly in our evaluation, we saw a, lot, you know, a number of challenges around, um, if you like, the kind of the vision for policing and, and how that has changed over time. So there was a very kind of strong focus on um, enforcement and on performance management in the kind of early days of reform. One can see a shift now as, as greater emphasis is now put on prevention and protection and um, localism and engagement. So, so those, those changes have taken time to, to, to play through. And I mean, a lot of people talk about reform as a, as a journey w with different phases. And I think the first phase was very much focused on integration and consolidation. And I think we're kind of coming to the end of that phase. The, the third phase is of transformation. And I think we're only just beginning to kind of see the possibilities of transforming the way that services, both in, in police and, and fire and rescue, are delivered. Um, so, yeah, so I, th I think... I think too many people saw reform at, as an event rather than a process, um, and that actually the process is a very complex one. Right. And the same question to Denise. Yeah, uh, I mean, we've very recently um, harmonised uniform terms and conditions in the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, and that's taken us five years. Um, five years to harmonise eight different legacy procedures, policies, terms and conditions. So that's really been challenging. Um, it's been challenging, especially when you're trying to unify the, the service is a national service, and you're having different resources, different standards, uh, different terms and conditions from each area. It's been a long process, and it's been a hard process. Um, I have to say relationships and industrial relations, you know, have, have gen generally been good with the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, and I think that's, that's helped that, that, that process along uh, more recently. Um, when, when you look ahead into transformation, we need to have the foundation settled first before we look at any form of transformation. Um, there's no point in building a house if you've not got the foundations there that's solid in the start. So I think a, a point to note here um, is that we don't just harmonise, we need to make sure that the policies are in place and the details are in place and, and the nuts and bolts are on those policies if we're, if we're looking to, to move forward in another direction. OK, that's helpful. We've got supplementaries from Rona. Uh, John and Lee McCarthy. Okay, thank you, convener. Good morning. Um, just to pick up on, Denise, really what you said at the beginning, um, it was just to get your views. During a Justice Committee visit to Montrose earlier this month, um, the fire um, officer in charge that we spoke to said that they felt um, on the operational side they had much more autonomy, um, less bureaucracy to go through to get things done and um, that there was more kind of um, cooperation. They, if they needed help from other forces, they could just call on it, whereas before that might have been a, a stumbling block. I wonder if you could maybe comment on that. They were quite, well, very complimentary but the operational side of it. Yeah, um, there, there has been collaboration work done with other agencies, um, and, you know, some parts of that 
have been reasonably su uh, successful. There's there's other other areas where you where you go into different um, role maps of a firefighter. So a firefighter's terms and conditions are based on their current role map identified in our terms and conditions, which is the grey book. To, to open up that role map, to take on other responsibilities, um, we have to go through a negotiation process and we'll have to make sure that the, the resources are there and also the, the training um, uh, is, there for, is there for firefighters to to succeed in that as well. And also the resilience. Um, you know, it's, uh, firefighters have got 300 hours um, a, a year to do their core fire service skills. If you look at a fire station that takes on another responsibility, a specialist responsibility, for example, water rescue or rope rescue, it's another 80 hours training that they need to do. Now, if we're going to work with other agencies and look at opening up the role of the firefighter, then, then we need to make sure that we've got the proper numbers in there, the proper resources and the proper infrastructure as well. Okay, thank you. And John? Yeah, thank you. It's, it's a question for Nick. And you, you touched on the international comparators and changes that take place there. One, one of the main drivers for the, as the Scottish Government saw, it, was the reduction in the block grant and a, a figure of 3.3 billion equating to 10%. To what extent did that, and similarly a figure of 12.8%, 50 million for the Fire and Rescue Service, did that shape the legislation and where we are now, do you imagine? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think, you know, because the reform involved all sorts of changes, not just to the structure of policing, but also to the structure of the governance of policing, that that had kind of lots of implications in terms of the relationship between, I suppose, the role of local government in, in the the, the new um, police service and um, and I suppose just the amount of um, influence that they had at a local level. I mean, by taking away some of that kind of financial contribution that local authorities made to policing, I think that brought with it sort of changes in the way they were able to actually influence kind of local decisions and play a role in the appointment of local officers and so on. So I, so I think it's kind of probably in, intertwined with some of those governance changes as well that has been important. And if I may very briefly, because um, there's others to come in, but uh, back in 2011, the inspectorate had talked about a weakness in police governance and accountability. This is an advance of, of reform. Mm -hmm. So that was an ongoing issue. Yes, yeah. And I, and I, you know, and I think it's been one of the things that's taken a long time to kind of um, create a structure of governance where there is a proper balance between the, the three elements, you know, b between the Scottish Government, between the, the police authority um, and, and between the police service. Um, and I think, you know, I think what we've seen in the early stages of reform was a degree of asymmetry in those relationships, you know, so, so effectively the Chief Constable and the Scottish Government were the more powerful partners and the police authority was a weak, weaker partner. I think now you're beginning to see a much more kind of... Um, you know, assertive sort of police authority, it's developed the capacity to kind of call the police to account. So I think all of that has taken time. I think there are still issues about how, how you engage local government more in the governance of, of policing, and I think that's kind of work in progress. Thank you. No, that's certainly an area we're going to come on to, um, because I don't think it was just money, it's the, the scrutiny role of local government and their ability to affect that I think we can move on to. Liam, I'll, I'll give you a shot, and then I really want to hear to more um, people around the table, and I'm conscious um, they're just come in when you want, Sandy. Um, I, yeah, I, I mean, likewise, uh, Camina, I was interested by what Nick Fife was saying in terms of the structure, but I wanted to go back to a point that um, I made earlier on in relation to uh, the uh, Transformation Fund. I mean, I recall criticisms of the approach taken in terms of college um, reorganisation restructuring, that the, um, the, the perceived savings and efficiencies were, were banked and assumed to be able to fund that reform, and I, I'm just interested, both in Ivor and, and, and next view in particular, as to whether or not that same error was made again, that the, the, the efficiencies and the savings were assumed um, and, and, and guaranteed and locked in and, and used as a, a, as a justification for not putting in uh, additional funding uh, to the, the transformation fund at that, through those early stages of, uh, of merger. Uh, I think it, there were 
Uh, my understanding, and I think Nick alluded to this, um, within the, the budget allocation, obviously, the, the big chunk of that um, goes on uh, wages, personnel. So, and there was the the fixture round about the number and the magic number of 17,234 officers and, and then um, the police staff. Um, so then, and then the, the business cases that was uh, structured indicated savings that were, were to be accrued year on year. To achieve that then, the only places that that, that could be squeezed out of was the, the police support staff roles um, and the very small part of the budget, which is running cars and fuel and business uh, buildings and so on and so forth. So the squeeze came on, on a lot of those issues. Um, unintended consequences of losing police staff and taking officers perhaps to do what away from what their, their uh, mainstream roles were to do, maybe support roles. So all of those factors um, mitigate against that ability as, as we're going through that process of amalgamation and integration. Um, we never really were able to get to the transformation projects and the money that was part of that or had been allocated by the government to help pump prime some of those transformation um, projects never really happened because... The red, the red line on, on police numbers was well known at the time of, yeah. the, the, uh, of the reform and of the legislation. So yeah. in a sense, when you talk about unintended consequences, I mean, surely the, the consequences of, 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 of greater efficiencies having to be derived from police staff and, and other areas must have been known. I'm just wondering whether the level of savings that were being assumed were, were, were either exaggerated or, 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 or wildly op optimistic. Yeah, absolutely. Those, those, those were known knowns going into mm. that. I think the issue was that the expectation, as I say about the outline business case and, and whatever due diligence was done around about the, the time, um, the expectation that those savings would be realised quickly in terms of amalgamation and stopping duplication and so on and so forth. I think the expectation was that those would come quickly. And, and the reality is, for something of the scale and complexity of putting eight police forces and two precursor organisations and then the changes to the governance above that, to achieve that within a time scale where the savings started to be rendered down was unrealistic. And that fact we've had five years of running with a structural deficit because the transformation hasn't <coughs> generated the income, then there was a bit of patch up and make do uh, in terms of the budget um, to keep it stable. Um, hopefully now as we sit with, with projects online for 2026, um, that, that will start to be some of that, albeit I know the service is, is in the um, process of um, looking particularly at this ICT infrastructure and, and um, putting towards a business case that says we still need money to make that transformation in that type of scale. So it comes back to that fundamental question of did we know the size and scale and complexity of it? Um, probably not. Just to, to, to right, Nick, sorry. I was just going to add, uh, just yeah. I've got a footnote. To that, I mean, yeah, I, th I think the costs of transformation were under underestimated, um, and the um, and I mean just to take one example, I mean the the investment in ICT to reap the benefits of having a single organisation as opposed to having eight legacy ICT systems um, is, is significant. I know you know there's a whole history associated with the I6 project, but since until you have that element um, sorted, then then a lot of the other benefits are much more difficult. To, to achieve. Um, I think the other interesting thing is I, I've been quite a close observer of the police reform in, in Norway, and it was interestingly, interesting that their approach initially was to invest hugely in the front line, so, um, particularly in technology. So their approach to reform was to give officers new um, uh, uh, IT equipment so that they could work more efficiently on the street. And then they started worrying about the kind of structural changes and back office functions. So it was a very different approach. You know, they started with the front line and then they looked at the, the sort of wider structures, whereas I think the approach here was to start with the structures and then sort of deal with the front line at a later stage. Can you supplementary? Yeah, I, I mean, you've sort of opened the Pandora's box of ICT, I'm afraid. Um, and I, I'm just wondering, so two questions. First of all, to what extent is the, the, the challenges of integration or lack of transformation, to, to what extent is that ICT we're talking about or and to what extent are there other things? And then the second question, and, and to you both, is what the practical consequences of that have been? I mean, we, we hear stories of, of police officers having to input uh, kind of into multiple systems for a single incident. I was just wondering if you could just bring that to life in terms of its practical consequences. 
I'll go first, Nick. Uh, I think ICT is, is uh, it's not, it's all about policing as a human endeavour. It's about how uh, women and men in the role of police officer interact with um, citizens, members of the public at times of crisis and times of need. Um, and it's about delivering that type of service. Um, ICT is an enabler towards that. And as Nick alludes to, if you invest properly uh, and give officers the right equipment, be that cars um, or um, radios or telephones or tablets, whoever it is, it may enable them to work more effectively, more efficiently. And particularly in, in the policing in the 21st century where information is critical um, across numerous systems and the access to that information about what we know about victims and witnesses and so on and so forth and how quickly we can access that, how quickly we can share that with partners it is an essential element of it, but it is an enabler towards um, delivering the service. The service is still anchored in uh, understanding our, what the, the fundamental basics of what policing is about and it's about enabling and encouraging training the officers to go out and do that job. And that can be in the front line, out there in, in the streets. But equally, there's a lot of talk about what the front line is, um, but it can be in terms of cyber crime and so on and so forth. So we need to understand the scale of what complexity is in 21st century policing. And ICT is an element of that, um, and an ever-growing element of that, I suppose, in terms of the, the technological world, world that we now occupy. But it, it can't be the be-all and end-all. If it's good, it can make our job easier, we can be more effective, we can be more efficient. If it's bad, we will still deliver a service, but it won't be as effective and efficient, perhaps. Yes, everyone happy with that. Um, talk to him. Yeah, uh, um, thanks, Commissioner. We've moved on a wee bit. Um, but I just want to go back to the case for reform, and I know that much of the driver was financial, as I said, but uh, as I said, we've, we have moved on a bit. But as Nick mentioned, there is other... Uh, other reasons and other drivers, and I just wonder, without going into other areas of questioning later, the sort of benefits and negative consequences, if um, the panel think that the reasons were generally sound for reform based on the need of the, the Scottish people in terms of policing and fire. It's nothing to do with the timeline that we thought well, you were well, asking. Well, I was going to say, I was going to say convener, I felt that um, Ivor Marshall had uh, covered the time, so I was going back to the original question, which was about reform. Right, well, Which I would have incorporated in the, yeah. the initial question. I think we were looking were there any other barriers to, to reform which hindered progress, you know, if you wanted to, to put that in, or do you feel we've, we've, we've covered the barriers and happy to well, move on? Anything well, you want well, to well, reply to, to Fulton's question? Yeah. And, and, and. The benefits yes, you've sure. seen, but I, I don't know if that's maybe coming up later on. It, it, we may well so go I'm into that, so if, if we yeah. move it on a little bit. Right, um, moving on then, can we look at yeah. Liam Cares? Yeah, but governance has been mentioned. That's an interesting um, uh, interesting contribution from Nick. So, uh, Liam, your question. Uh, yeah, thanks, Convino. So, <clears throat> uh, Professor Fife, you talked about the structure and the government, governance in particular, and there was certainly some evidence uh, that we've seen that suggests that the structure uh, that you alluded to, the Police Scotland, the SPA, uh, may not be ideal uh, or sufficiently clear. Uh, so do any of the witnesses have any views on that structure and in particular the role of the SPA as defined uh, and as it has come to be? Um, I, yeah. I suppose my you know, first observation is, is that... Um, Again, I think there was an underestimation of how, how long it would take to establish new governance arrangements at the outset of reform. Um, and while I think, you know, the, if you like, the preparations in terms of the operational side of policing had been happening for some time, I think the actual establishment of SBA happened very quickly. It's taken time to, to I think, get the right mix of skills and knowledge within that organisation. Uh, and my sense now is, that, you know, it's in a much better place that, than it was. Um, I, I think one of the key issues that, that we've been looking at is, is that relationship between um, local authorities and the, and the SPA, and, and the, particularly the relationship between local <coughs> scrutiny committees and the SPA, and, um, and I suppose really trying to find effective ways in which that, those, those local concerns can be fed through into a, a national body. Because I think you know, it's, it's a common theme throughout reform is that balance between centralisation and localisation. And I think there was a feeling in the, in the early stages of reform that the, the focus was much more on the national and on the centralisation of activity, both 
in terms of kind of governance arrangements and in terms of um, kind of operational and strategic elements. And now I think I think the focus needs to be much more on trying to address that balance and think about how um, localism is made a stronger uh, has a stronger presence in discussions about policing. Um, and and you can see that through policing 2026, the stra strategic document that Police Scotland and SPA produced much greater focus on, on localism within that. I think now in terms of governance, it's a question of how, how do those local scrutiny committees have a, you know, have a voice at a national level? Because many of those decisions that are being taken nationally have all sorts of local implications. Um, and I think at the moment, or certainly in the early stages of reform, they didn't really have a particularly strong voice in those, in the outcomes of those decisions. Uh, back on that, but Cosler, definitely. Yeah. And either Mick or um, uh, uh, Lennox. Um, I would absolutely echo um, what you're saying there. I think that local government really welcomed the fact that um, the Act provided for the creation of um, local uh, scrutiny committees. Um, I think there has been a disconnect, and I think that we're now catching up with that at the moment. So COSA um, and Police Scotland and the SPA are, are, you know, have a, a joint officer group at the moment that's working to try and, and bridge that disconnect, um, because at the moment there are decisions that are made at a national level that have implications at a local level um, without that input. So if local police scrutiny um, and fire uh, forums are, are there to make um, decisions at a local level, we think it's, it's imperative that they feed up to um, COSLA level, so we've got a, a police scrutiny uh, forum at COSLA, and then we need to have that then feeding up the way to, to the national um, bodies that are going to be making decisions, because if not, um, it's going to feel as if the decisions are being made and then handed down uh, to local level to implement. So I, I feel as if we're on that journey at the minute, and we're, we're actually going to make a big difference um, with that, that joint officer group to, 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 you know, to, to build the bridge between. Yeah. Yes, just to add to what Councillor Whittam said, yes, I think overall, um, you know, I've had, had quite a negative experience, local government, of their arrangements for policing in Scotland over the last five years. Obviously, more recently, has worked to improve those arrangements under the leadership of the new chair of the SP and with our uh, council uh, cause I spoke to Councillor Whittam. Um, but, you know, we've had an, a number of experiences over the years, everything from more recently TTROs last October to uh, counter closure, police counter closures, uh, CCTV, um, policing, a number of controversial issues that have emerged because national decisions have been taken without sufficient dialogue, communication, meaningful engagement with local government, uh, local elected members as part of that process. So that's something that obviously will, that needs to be addressed and improved upon. And we're obviously working with the SP and Police Scotland and Solace Local Authority Chief Executives to address. But it has been a learning experience. I feel if there had been more local accountability um, and, and more um, power, if you like, at a local level, then a case could have been made either to support or um, try and change some of the decisions that were made locally. A better case could have been made. Absolutely. I, I think that if you involve um, the layer of governance that's most directly mm -hmm. closest to the communities um, at an early level, um, right, you know, at the, at the creation and the ideation stage of, of policy um, decision makings, then we are going to have um, an influence and we are going to you know, we would be able to actually make a, a better outcome and a better case locally when we are involved in, in um, the decisions that are being taken. And that's because one size doesn't fit all, too. Yeah. John. Yeah, I wonder, I'd like to ask Nick, um, it's, it, Ivor touches on the fact that it was actually 10 organisations that came together. And if we're comparing the present arrangement with the previous arrangements, I wonder if the same argument could be made historically about the dearth of local accountability, for instance, of the Scottish Drug Enforcement Agency or the central services elsewhere. Because I want to maximise local involvement. But is that a reasonable comparator? Because there was zero input from local authorities to those. Yeah, wasn't yeah no, no, I think that's a very reasonable comparison. Yeah, yeah th I think the governance r arrangements for those bodies didn't <coughs> allow for any kind of local kind of input into the sort of decisions and, and um, deliberations of those groups. So, yeah, I, th I think that is a fair comparison. Yeah. OK, thank you. Um, yeah. Anyone else want to uh, ask on that just aspect? Have you finished, Liam, or was there something else you wanted to add? I'm going to go on. Um, just, uh, Professor Fife, if I may, on the <clears throat> do you take a view, then, based on what you said earlier, on whether the, the SPA's recent 
challenges uh, then have been personality and or culture driven such that the recent changes in personnel will uh, positively impact uh, on the SPA's operations or is there something endemic in the structure uh, that mitigates against uh, the efficient working? No, I, I mean, I, I think the, the structure can be made to work better, you know, as it is. And, and, I, and I, think, I think the production of the Policing 2026 document was, was a bit of a watershed from this perspective. And it was a joint strategy between Police Scotland and SPA. And it showed that when they, you know, by through working together, you know, they could come to a joint vision of what policing in Scotland would be about um, and what its priorities would look like and so on. So, I th you know, I think there is evidence of really good, effective working between those two, two organisations, you know, beginning to emerge. Um, I think, you know, again, it's probably part of the evolution um, of SPA is making sure that you had the right skills and knowledge in terms of uh, the, the composition of the board and, and the wider organisation, and so I, th you know, and I think as um, Elena has, has referred to, you know, ensuring that connection between SPA and <coughs> local government is a strong one. Um, so, so I, I feel that a lot of progress is, is now being made. I think in the early days, yeah, there was a kind of you know disconnect between SPA and, and uh, local communities, and between SPA and Police Scotland. You know that um, Police Scotland were forging ahead with, with quite rapid change, and I think SPA were struggling to kind of keep up with some of the things that were emerging from that. So, do you take a view then on whether a single oversight body, the SPA, is is the best mechanism? Is this the best structure to hold Police Scotland to account, or is there in your view, a better way? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I, I think it can be made to work effectively. I, th I think it's important to see it as part of a, a wider landscape of governance. So you've got, it's not just the SBA on, it, on its own. You've also got um, HMICS, you've got Audit Scotland, you've got other bodies that are kind of there to, to call the police to account. Um, so, so at one level, I, th I, th I think it, it, it can do a very good job and and I think one shouldn't look back to the previous arrangements, if you like, with rose-tinted glasses. You know, the, the previous police authorities had their own challenges and weaknesses uh, about them. Um, but I, I, th I think the key thing is, is now to kind of address that issue about how you get a stronger local voice in the deliberations of, of SPA. Thank you. Uh, it's worth then in terms of that and answer the questions maybe backwards. I think um, I th I've seen improvements in terms of... Um, those relationships at, at that strategic level. I think um, the, the police authority, and as Nick alludes to various other elements, HMICS, um, the force executive, um, working in a more collaborative, um, cohesive way in terms of a shared leadership responsibility rather than a sort of fractured one, I think, um, if we're being candid, to some of the some of the personalities and some of the leadership styles and some of the tensions in the early days and disputes about the interpretation of the legislation about who had responsibility for police staff were unhelpful. That festered for some time and and um, uh, took considerable time to un, uh, sort of resolve itself, which I think we still haven't um, managed to achieve harmonisation for our police support staff in terms of pay, and that probably the genesis of that goes away back then. Um, but it is on a better trajectory now, um, and I think uh, it's incumbent upon all of us who are involved in that to try and um, help shape that going forward. Um, in ter I, th I still think there are issues in terms of um, the centralist versus the local. Um, and again, it's taking time for that to work through. Having been a commander in a, in a, a division with four local authorities, um, I had very good positive relationships with four scrutiny boards, all very different, all with very different needs. And I know that my colleagues um, who are in similar positions have very positive relationships like that. Um, and that has been a continuation of many years um, of those positive relationships. I think the voice of those local scrutiny boards um, affecting national policies hasn't um, been heard as strongly as it could and should have been. And I think there are other factors in terms of financial controls and a very centralist approach to, to cuts and budgets that mean that, that local commanders, local area commanders, do not have autonomy in terms of, or as much flexibility in terms of budgets to enable them to commit to local initiatives in partnership with local authorities, um, which in essence is stymieing things like community planning, community empowerment, 
Um, I have 29 years in this job and I've yet to see real progress getting made in, in proper community planning and community empowerment. And it comes down to the fact that money cannot be shared across budgets at times. And I think they follow the money trail sometimes uh, and trust the people who are um, in positions of local management at times to, to give local services. So I think there is uh, an egg to be cracked in terms of that um, centralist, nationalist control in terms of big entities vis-a-vis -vis what's important for local communities. Denise, I don't know from the FPU um, perspective. Um, got thanks, Chair. There. The, the governance point in relation to to the fire service, well, you know, we've got the fire, for, the, the, the fire board and I believe that there's insufficient um, knowledge of uh, operational matters or operational experience. So the fire board scrutinises the fire and rescue service um, and they will be given papers and policies and procedures from officers within the fire service. But throughout that fire board, there's no independent scrutiny from a, a professional viewpoint, an operational viewpoint. Um, and we suggest that a mechanism uh, should be identified so that the board has ready access to independent objective advice and information in respect of operation, operational matters. Um, and that's included known or potential projected impact of proposals um, on operational matters. So if you need to scrutinize an organization, you must have the knowledge uh, and information and experience to do that. Uh, and we believe that's currently not happening within the current board structures. Could you give an example of, of um, how that plays out, where, where the, the fault line lies? Well, for example, uh, the, to, to, to crew up previously before um, we amalgamated uh, into the single Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, you had a minimum amount of fire, firefighters on appliance uh, to have a safe crew model to go to a fire or an incident. Um, Recently, uh, that crew model has went from five firefighters from each from on each fire appliances to five and four. Now, as operational firefighters and experienced members within the fire brigade union, um, we know the impact a reduction can have when you reduce the amount of firefighters on a fire appliance. When those policies and those procedures go toward to, a, to to the fire board, then we believe that they need to have the independent knowledge and advice to give them all the information so that they can make an informed choice to scrutinise or to agree with the decision of the fire service. So that's one specific example. And that's very helpful. Um, Daniel, you're just supplementing before I move on to Rona to develop this a bit. Yeah, I'm just interested in, in this point around the interplay between uh, the centre and, and local scrutiny panels, and in particular following on from Ivor Marshall's point there. I mean, to, to, to really strengthen local scrutiny panels, do we need to actually see kind of that that that, that, that flow of money point? Can I interrupt you there, Daniel. You're actually on Rona's question exactly. So can we come back to? I think you had another point, didn't you? <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think yeah. The, the direction um, Daniel was going in. Um, from what I'm gathering, I mean, I'm, I'm listening to what you're saying about how it's taken a long time for things to um, begin to reach the, the objective. Are we, are, we, are we going in the right direction? We're in the right trajectory as far as local policing and local scrutiny goes. I know there's been a, there's a long way to go. Um, Councillor um, Whittam, you say in your submission, the model of local policing has allowed councils to retain a local relationship through local police commanders. Um, so, so that's a positive. Um, and I think we're all agreed that it's also um, maybe eradicated some duplication of services, which is also positive. So it's really just to try and, and, and sort of wrap up mainly what, what Daniel was saying about the, the, the scrutiny. Are we going in the right direction? Do you think we'll get there soon? And, um, you know, any other benefits that you can think of so far in the first five years? And is there anything you want to add to that, Daniel? And sorry, Daniel, yes, what you... Oh, and I was just going to ask, it, 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 you, will, will the scrutiny panels, do they need kind of essentially budgetary control and powers of appointment in order to really have the, sort of the teeth to be heard, um, is really my question. There's quite a lot there. Um, who'd like to take that in, Lena? There's quite a lot there. Um, I think that in terms of, of the scrutiny, I think that we will get there. I think that we're, we're making um, great strides if we continue on the path that we're going at the minute. I think that you know um, local government will um, have the influence that it needs to have at that level. I think that we do need to make sure that, you know, divisional commanders are adequately resourced and empowered to make decisions um, that are going to help 
um, their community planning partners and them deliver services on the ground at a local level. Um, we've always kind of felt that perhaps the, 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 the scrutiny com committee should have um, some involvement in um, making local decisions when it comes to, to budgetary spend, um, appointments, etc. That you know that is something that we would um, welcome a discussion on going forward. Um, I do think that we've made great strides um, having the, the chair of, of the new chair of the SPA and indeed the fire board um, coming to our um, meetings at COSLA has been really well received by the representatives from all 32 local authorities that sit on that um, committee. So I, I think we're, we're on the right path now, um, but I do believe that we need to make sure that we can empower the divisional commanders to be able to to do what we the good work that they're doing. There's so much good work that's been doing on community planning partner boards all round about Scotland, um, and it's just how we build on that. And I think that is about devolving more power down the way. Mike, did you have anything to add to? I think I really broadly concur with everything that Councillor Whittam said. Um, it's a work in progress um, in terms of um, improving governance, arranging for the SPA. Obviously, move along positively so far. I think it's a bit been in that place where we're, where we're comfortable with each other's positions with SP and, and, and Police Scotland. Yes, exactly what Council Whitham said, it would be very much helpful at a local level if uh, local police commanders could be empowered uh, in respect of uh, having more autonomy and deploying resources in line with local priorities that are articulated by elected members, so obviously closest to their communities when it comes to issues relating to policing and obviously have more scope locally as well because a lot of systems are centralised and process uh, systems and processes from Police Scotland are uh, fairly centralised and the need to have them where more adaptable and flexible to meet local circumstances. Nick and did I or did you want to come in? Nick. Yeah, yeah I mean I absolutely agree with, with what's been said. I, I think the other point I would add is is I think we just need to re-engage with the policing principles that were, the set, that were set out in the original <coughs> Police and Fire Reform Act that say some really good things about you know, what I think is a very progressive vision of policing, which is it's about community well-being, it's about working in partnership with localities and communities and so on. In a sense, I think we, we just kind of need to re-engage with those principles because I think they're a very, really good statement about how policing should be a partnership between different bodies and it should be focused on community well-being. Did you have something about reviewing and going back to in, in your submission to you, that very point? You know, the, the, the aim is there, but it hasn't been achieved. So uh, going back and looking, see, uh, where do we need to...? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, my sense is that we kind of lost sight of those policing principles for yeah. the first three or four years of reform. Um, and, and understandably, there were other kind of pressures and, and demands and so on. But I think the Policing 2026 document is a a really good step in that direction. But I so say there's a really good statement about the purpose of policing in the 21st century in, embedded within the legislation. And I think if we go back and, and since make that reality, then I think that would be a really positive mm -hmm. step. And is that almost going back to what you were saying about where they started in other countries? Mm. It's almost that point they started at. Y yes, and actually the other countries look at our legislation and are really impressed at the statement about policing that is set out there because mm. it, you know, and also unlike in England and Wales, where the focus has much been very much on, on crime reduction and a very you know um, crime-centred view of policing, the, the statement in the Scottish legislation is about well-being. It's about harm reduction. It's about a much more holistic vision mm -hmm. of policing, which I think is much more in tune with the, you feel like the needs of kind of vulnerable populations. Okay, and Ivor, yeah. Uh, just to be absolutely clear, I think that the relationships at local levels with and divisional commanders, local area commanders, um, with communities, with scrutiny boards, with partners, is uh, has always been strong, has continued to be strong. I think it's one of the things that has transcended through all of this. I think the... Maybe in the early days, some of the partnerships the service withdrew from some of those because they were so busy um, doing things, and, and some of that's been re-established. The commitment, the intention to collaborative working is, is still exceptionally strong. I think my point would be that um, you can commit a certain amount of people resource to issues, um, but you don't necessarily have um, a discretionary budget that enables you to run initiatives, um, to match fund certain things, because money is so tight and it's been drawn um, away from 
um, maybe that local structure that we perhaps used um, prior to Police Scotland because of, of the budget pressures. Um, and I suppose it's about empowering and enabling um, local managers to do some of that. I think that would be my position. Um, to give you a tangible example of frustrations around some of this, um, you still in certain pockets, um, local authorities did fund community officers for certain divisions. And if that funding was withdrawn, then those officers were taken away from divisions and, and centrally be, uh, withdrawn. That was all part of this big panoply in terms of maintaining officer numbers and who was paying for what and so on and so forth. And it was all, to be honest, a frustration round about um, taking officers, from my point of view at that time in the division, taking officers away from doing a very, very important community role um, to make a political point about where the budget and where the money came from. And I think that was wrong. Now, that, that, can I just reiterate, that's around the fringes of what is a very strong um, partnership in terms of local policing and local engagement and, and working and relationships with local communities. I think that's still exceptionally strong. I just would like to add that wee bit of polish on top by giving local uh, area commanders and divisional commanders um, a bit of discretionary budget that they could do that wee bit more. Can I just add to that? I've have we, are we starting to go back that way? Because, I mean, in my local authority, we have community policemen. They're still there, so I'm not yeah. quite sure the point you're making, that they weren't there. Does that, does that in differ? Some, in some places, um, there were legacy arrangements where local authorities had funded police officers. Uh -huh. So they had commit, committed budget from yeah. you know, whatever mm -hmm. council it was into the police budget, and that paid for certain officers, so 10 officers in a particular yeah. um, local authority area. And those were generally community-based officers. Mm. If that money was withdrawn by that council yeah. from Same Police Scotland, yeah. because they no longer um, felt they could support that, then those 10 officer posts mm -hmm. were withdrawn and taken back into the Police Scotland overall 17, 2, 3, 4, and taken away from that local division, whether they were needed or not around some of that at times. So, as I say, it's a small thing around about that, and it's probably now an issue that is being expunged probably from the, the funding envelope for Police Scotland because the, the vast majority of it comes from um, from central budget. But I don't know from a local authority, causal point of view, they may have yeah, a view on that. Yeah. Yeah, yes, I think you do. Um, I actually was going to um, kind of give another live example that's happening um, at the moment um, in terms of, of local resources for, for um, divisional commanders. We can have a, a huge amount of initiatives happen at a local level in conjunction with um, the police and our community planning partners. And my own authority area, the, the um, police down there have become trauma informed. So um, they're, they're becoming completely aware of adverse childhood experiences. That's embedded right through our community planning partnership um, strategic aims. Um, and our divisional commander would love to do some initiatives, but he doesn't actually have the resources to be able to do it or to match fund anything that the local authority is going to do. So we can have historic examples of where um, you, you have local um, government fund officers within um, the police. You also have current um, situations where um, the police are, are looking at national priorities. You know, ACEs are a national priority that we're all looking at. We want to, you know, to, to figure out how we can deal with that at a local level and to do you know, community justice. We need to be able to understand all of that. And there we have a police um, divisional commander that's really want to do it, but doesn't actually have any money, any budget to do any work. Denise, do you have any um, any comments around, around that particular aspect, the, the localism, the um, the ability to to set your, your local priorities? Yeah, I, I think it's the same as you know as what I mentioned in relation to the police. Uh, you know, senior managers in senior local authority areas. Um, I think the frustration there is that they do not have the budgets to, to look at local needs. So, for example, up in the North area or the Highlands of, of Scotland, it's a completely different demographic than a city centre of Glasgow or Edinburgh. So the resources there and the ability to, to respond to different incidents, incidents and different initiatives are going to be different and, and more complex than, I would say, the city centre of Edinburgh or Glasgow. So more autonomy need, needs to be needed locally but also, in order to have that autonomy, they must have the budget responsibility and the freedom to, to use that as well. Yeah, the autonomy to have the flexibility to, to deal with the, 
the issues. Absolutely. <clears throat> I apologise to Shona and um, Sandy. We're coming to you, but it follows on Daniel's next question. I know you've got a very specific and good um, example to give Sandy, and Shona will be asking about that. But just to conclude this part, Daniel. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I think the... The questions around the, 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 the resource available to local divisions, I think, is, is, is really key. I mean, I think that you know, one of the key drivers towards the creation of a uh, single police force was about uh, specialist divisions and, and so on. But I, I just wonder how much that has taken priority and that has been at a cost to local divisions, as, as, whether you look at the availability uh, locally or in just in terms of police numbers. I mean, I believe in the last five years, uh, local divisions have lost 326 officers and, and regional uh, forces have 79, uh, lost around 79. Uh, I was just wondering to what extent that, that, you know, the, the, the people around the table would, would think about where that balance lies between kind of the national specialist and, and, and local divisions and, and whether or not that needs to be redressed just in terms of police numbers. Looking at me, I'll, I'll go first. Um, I don't think there's an easy answer to that, uh, in as much as I think the, the services has embarked upon as part of uh, the 2026 10-year strategy, um, demand and productivity analysis. I think that work needs to be accelerated and properly understand um, what the picture of demand across policing in Scotland in, in the 21st century um, currently is and what we project it to be over um, the next few years. And as a consequence of that, uh, understand what the resources that it's going to take to address that. Um, whether that's the current envelope of 17, 2, 3, 4 officers plus the support staff plus the budget that it takes to run that, or whether it's more or whether it's less, can be then assessed. And in terms of the roles of whether those are specialist roles for national assets, for support, for firearms, search, public order, CBRN, cyber fraud, whatever those specialist resources are on a national level, we could understand that. And then significantly for me, um, what is required in terms of local policing, local divisions. Um, as I sit here at the moment, I would suggest that there probably is a bit of uh, uh, you know, lack of clarity about what the, where the resources need to be um, in a local level and whether or not those demands are um, being addressed appropriately, whether we've got that right. Um, I, and whether the withdrawal of, of perhaps resources that used to be in local policing to support those centralist roles has been the right thing. Certainly, um, if the indications are that there has been a sort of removal of, of some resources into that centralist role, those centralist roles, um, but there may be a good business case for that. Um, but sometimes what you're fighting against is the acute challenges, perhaps, of a sex abuse inquiry that needs to be resourced in a time-critical way or um, firearms resources that need to be uplifted because of the terror threat going up. Um, so it's, it's acute and, and the strategic commanders have to make that decision to put resources to that. And that has to come from somewhere. And the most obvious place where it ulti ultimately trickles down and comes from is from the front line operational uniform resources, because you always tend to take people away from there. And the question is, is that chronic removal over time, which is drip, 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 um, because you're, you're addressing acute issues, what's, what's happening there? And I know from my Federation colleagues who are more in tune with the frontline officers in the uniform feel that that, that chronic um, erosion perhaps is not being seen and that there's a, a stretch in local policing which is, is getting to a very, very difficult point. Does that answer your question? I think so. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm against what Ivor said. I mean, this is an area that we've looked at in some detail as part of our evaluation. Um, and I mean, it was clear in our discussions with local officers that they, they can see the benefits of having these specialised resources that they can access, um, particularly to do with you know, complex crimes. It might be to do with a murder. It might be to do with other areas like high-risk missing persons. So being able to draw on those resources um, is definitely seen as, as a benefit. 
the things that they have been concerned about, um, what, one is the redeployment of officers from local um, policing teams into those specialist services and they're not being replaced, so they feel it's a, a, a diminution in, in, in the local resource. I think their other concern is about how they access those resources, so how do they bid for them and, and how bureaucratic is that process. Um, so, um, you know, they're, they're concerned about how quickly can they mobilise those resources yeah. if they need them. Uh, locally. Um, I think a third theme is, is just that interface between specialised, centralised resources and the local knowledge of local offices. Yeah. That, um, you know, local offices have a huge amount and very rich kind of local knowledge about what's happening in their communities. So there needs to be an effective way that that knowledge is shared with more specialist teams that might be coming in from you know, out with that local, local area. Um, and, and then just the, the a final point that was raised by um, officers was what does that mean in terms of their careers? So what does a career path look like for a specialist officer as opposed to somebody who's in the local policing team? And I think there was a sense that those working in specialised functions were being quite well supported in terms of career development and, and skills and so on. Those in local policing teams were relatively neglected. Um, and so it was kind of creating a slightly you know, sort of two-tier system. Mm -hmm. On career point, I noticed that was something else you brought up in your submission, Ivor. Would you like to add to that? Yeah, uh, corroborate the next point, I think there, there is that concern, perhaps, that there's a divergence between the sort of specialist um, national roles vis-à-vis -vis local policing. And we, I, th I think we do uh, want to avoid, uh, and it was always a, an issue during reform, concern that you've got that sort of American model where the sort of national FBI type and the local policing and that never the twain should meet. I uh, definitely want to avoid that, and it's, n it's nowhere near as, as, as bad as that. But there are sentiments round about specialists are are more visible, it's the sort of sexier part of policing perhaps, as opposed to local policing. From my members, uh, superintendents and chief superintendents point of view, I think there's a, there is a concern that we have seen um, a sort of natural drawing of those types of senior posts more towards central locations because that's where the demand tends to be, that's where some of the, most of the specialist roles seem to be. Um, so, and we, as we've seen officers retire perhaps from parts of the north, far north or from the south, th who were perhaps in a national role, um, that role being sort of um, uh, engineered into the central belt. So it's, it's reducing the opportunities for people who hold um, higher rank to, to remain in, in more rural parts of Scotland. So we definitely are advocating for, we, we need to be flexible and agile in our ability to enable officers to work through all parts of Scotland, um, use technology, um, because I think if you, if you do that, if you limit the, uh, the opportunities um, to a point because of geography, and if that tends to be, then the officers or and staff may choose not to pursue certain promotions and so on and so forth, and that means we're losing out um, potentially on the real talent uh, pool right across Scotland, um, because people will choose perhaps because of family commitments or whatever it happens to be not to move. So I think it's something that we need to be very, very mindful of and have meaningful conversations with all of our staff to know um, where they are, what their development needs are and what the potential is so that we can maximise the entire workforce, um, not those just who, are, who happen to be geographically located in the right place. Can, can I ask a brief follow-up point on that? I mean, one comment that's been expressed to me is, that, is the flip of that, which is that um, you're also developing over-specialised uh, you know, senior police officers you know, and, and there may, we're maybe losing a, a breadth of experience uh, from senior officers. Is that something that you'd agree with and reflect? Um, again, there's a balance to be struck because if you invest in um, certain specialist roles, um, so if that's in terms of counter-terrorism and so on and so forth, they, they, to build up a level of expertise around some of those uh, uh, areas, it's really important that we don't lose that. And, and people may have a career path, and I think in terms of a national service now, you can see people having a career path um, in a sort of ascendancy in certain specialisms. And I get that to a point. I think we need to be very mindful of that. There's there's a real benefit in cross fertilisation um, and trying to keep that uh, as much as we can. And I know in, in through my career and I've seen it with others, there's that almost sometimes between doing a central role but always going back to your next posting being in a, a more local localised way. And if if the service can accommodate that and facilitate that, and if it knows its people well enough to to do that, then you share the knowledge and you share the expertise and and you share the experience, so that if you if you are 
Um, and if you've been in a specialist role for a long number of years, it's easy to forget about how, how acute things are, perhaps, in a local policing context. And if you go back out there, then you realise, actually, everything's not in the, the specialist world. Um, everything comes down to happening in a local community, affecting local citizens. So it's always good to have that touchstone, in my opinion. Okay. I'll bring Elena. And Nick, something you said, I think, it sums it up quite nicely, the lack of clarity around career development and training opportunities for local officers in the new national uh, organisation is contributing to, to low morale. Mm, that, yes, yeah. In, in, you know. And, and my, my sense is that that's something that, you know, that, that is now being ad <coughs> addressed. But um, certainly in the early stages of reform, I think that was an area that wasn't given um, a high priority and therefore people um, did feel that they just didn't really, I suppose, understand what their career paths would look like in this new organisation mm -hmm. um, because it was a huge change for them. I think it, it does raise a, a wider question, which I, I think is an, an important thing to, to, for there to be a bigger conversation about, which is what is the, if you like, the size and shape of the workforce that, that Scotland needs because I think... Um, again, you know, you look at international comparisons. Um, uh, Scotland has has a lot of police officers compared to countries like um, Norway or Sweden or Finland, which have similar sizes in terms of population. Um, and the kind of conversations they're having in those countries is about, you know, what are the skills that are needed um, given the changing nature of the demand on police organisations, and, and particularly if you take one area, cyber. You know, cyber is a huge um, and increasingly important area of of policing activity, the skills that you need for people to tackle those issues are very different from the skills that have traditionally been the focus of, of um, police training. So you may be you may you may need more civilian people to come into the force to kind of work in those areas, and th therefore the balance between um, you know uniformed officers and civilian officers, perhaps civilian staff, needs needs to be rethought. Elena, yeah, um, just very briefly, because I, I know that there's other questions to come, but um, it, it was just to make the point that um, local government and local councillors really do welcome the shift back to locality policing, and you know we're seeing that, and we're going out to, to community council meetings, and whilst we know that the, the you know the, the kind of specialist um, areas that we have, whether it's counterterrorism um, or uh, cyber cybercrime, etc., is really important. We also know that the the knowledge that local police officers have in the areas that they're serving um, is now only going to be widened because they're actually now allowed that time to become community policing again. And for us, that makes a big difference um, at local government level. So we really welcome that shift back that we're seeing. And Denise? Yes, we've had the same experiences in the fire service. It has been difficult to, to recruit and retain um, senior managers, middle managers in more rural areas. Previously, if you wanted to go for a promotion, you went for a promotion within your, your own brigade, which was a local, a local brigade out, uh, out of one of the eight. Now we're finding it more frequent that, that you know, firefighters and middle managers, when they're going for promotion, it potentially could be a move from Edinburgh up to Inverness or Glasgow to Aberdeen. And those posts are expanding. We're feeling that you know, those middle managers and senior managers are taking on much more responsibility in those roles than what they previously had within the former Legacy 8 Brigades. This is causing uh, undue stress. Morale is low. We've, we've seen a report last year, um, a freedom of, freedom of information report that states that there's been a five uh, crease infold uh, in the Fire and Rescue Service of people going off work with, with work-related stress and pressures. So it has been very, very difficult to, to recruit and, and, and retain those individuals. And more recently, the Auditor General report has come out and spoken about the succession planning within the senior elements of the Scottish Fire and Rescue Services that, that, that can be quite worrying. OK. Supplementary, John? Yeah, it's, it's a question for Nick. I, I wonder to what extent, Nick, you believe that this discussion, whether there had or hadn't been reform, would be taking place anyway about the growing specialism. And particularly around the use of language, I mean, as a Green, I'm very keen on the use of the word local. I think local is terribly important, but it's bandied about quite casually. So, for instance, locally, in Forfar, we visited two highly significant national specialist units. Now, it wouldn't be presented as, as, as such. Similarly, in the Highlands and Islands, where there were challenges around the fire service, there are two state-of-the-art training facilities that hadn't been there previously. Is the language sometimes adding to confusion? I wonder. Yeah, 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 no, I think that's a good point. And, and 
And, and some of that, I think, goes back to actually to the original legislation, which talked about local policing, but never mm -hmm. defined what local policing is. And and I think, you know, what we've seen over the last five years is it is a you know a very sort of important debate about what you know what is local, um, and and what are the kind of local implications of national decisions. So um, and say, I mean, it's a debate that's happening all over Europe. You know, it's, it's not peculiar to Scotland, and um, and I, th and I think, you know, the, the thing that clearly emerges from those discussions is, are these issues about local empowerment? Are these issues about um, ensuring that policing is sufficiently flexible to meet local needs and that, that there are ways in which local communities can articulate what their, their needs are? Um, but also recognising that a lot of the demands made on policing are national and international in terms of their origins and character and so you need to maintain national and, and international collaborations in order to kind of tackle you know whether it's organized crime counterterrorism cyber and so on so I, I, yeah I think language is, is really important and sometimes I suppose we don't unpack enough what we mean by local um, both in a kind of operational sense but also in terms of those wider st strategic um, requirements okay. sure. Uh, th thanks, Convener. I think what's sometimes lost in this debate is what the reforms, the merger, have meant for people receiving services, what the outcomes are, for example, for the victims of crime. And I was very struck by uh, Sandy Brinley's uh, evidence on behalf of Rape Crisis Scotland, where you've stated that the move to a single police force has transformed the way rape and other sexual crimes are investigated in Scotland. And it would be useful, I think, to hear from Sandy about what that's meant for the outcomes for women before and after the merger. And if you could give some examples in, in terms of what that has meant uh, for, for that and, and, in your view, how that has been achieved. Yes, of course. Um, I think it's not for us to comment in any detail on the governance and finance aspects of a single force, but certainly in terms of the direct feedback from people that we are working with who are reporting crime across Scotland, I, I, I would say in general terms it has transformed since the advent of a single force. Um, I think there was progress underway through ACPOS prior to the single force, but I think having one structure has really assisted in the move to specialism and I think it's the move to specialism in investigating sexual crime that has made such a concrete difference for people that we're working with. We have a feedback protocol with Police Scotland where we proactively ask callers that come to us through the Police Scotland referral um, a number of questions about their experience of reporting to the police and then we provide monthly reports to Police Scotland summarising people's feedback. And I, I, I would say, overwhelmingly, the feedback is positive. And that's not to say there aren't still learnings or people who are unhappy with their experience. But these <laughs> days, it, it is very, very much the exception. Whereas I, I would say, even 10 years ago, we were frequently hearing complaints about the response from the, the police to people reporting sexual crime. So in our experience, it's been very, very positive. I think the structure enables specialism, but also in our experience, the structure assess where there are difficulties. Our experience is Police Scotland are very much open to working in partnership with organisations like Rape Crisis Scotland. They're very keen to be proactive in getting feedback, to learn from that, and where there are difficulties, and we notify Police Scotland of the difficulties, I think the structure of Police Scotland really enables any learning from complaints to be integrated within practice much more easily than when it was distinct forces across Scotland, where I think there were a number of challenges in responding to improving responses to sexual crime. Can, can I perhaps ask you, Sandy, I mean, was one of the major game changers the fact that the Crown and Procurator Fiscal Service then prioritised um, the, the prosecution of rape and, and sexual um, assault cases and set up the dedicated union. Now, that happened, I think, under Stephen House, under the new police force as the, the single force commander. So trying to tease out, and I take your point completely about communication, I think that's an important point. If that was able, that message was able to cascade down within a single force, absolutely. But just to tease out the extent to which the new policies change within the Crown and Procurator Fiscal contributed I, I, to my, it. My, my experience is that it's Police Scotland that have led the way in transforming the response to uh -huh. sexual crime. And it, 
but without being over critical, I think there are still a number of difficulties um, in relation to the prosecution of crime that hasn't quite matched, uh, and our experience, the improvements in the policing side of the, the approach. So I, I think it is very much the creation of a single force. But, oh, but not to minimise, I, I think there's a number of individuals within Police Scotland who have shown real leadership um, in driving forward these improvements. But I think the new structure has enabled that to make a concrete difference to people across Scotland reporting sexual crime. Okay. Jonah? And I, I think one picking up from you, Sandy, is that previously there may have been a, a bit of a geographical variation, potentially. Um, in the way that the, the police responded to uh, sexual crimes. And what you're saying is that there is now a, a consistency of approach. So if a woman is reporting a sexual crime, whether it's um, in, in Orkney, Inverness or Glasgow or Edinburgh, it, it doesn't matter. The response is still the same. And has that... So, first of all, is that the case? Um, and are there any remaining issues to be addressed around making sure that 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 uh, consistency is applied across all geographical areas? Are there any remaining issues there? And at the heart of that, has it been about, um, yes, the use of specialist officers, but also about the training of police officers more generally across the board, including those working in the, in the community? Uh, in our experience, the, the, the biggest issue when people have a negative experience reporting a sexual crime to the police is attitudinal, and I think that is about shifting a culture within an organisation with a significant workforce. Uh, in our experience, the single force has assisted with that. I, I think we're still seeing some cases coming through Park that were um, from the previous forces that I would hope wouldn't happen now um, under the single force because there is now the structure of the rape task force that has oversight in a way that we didn't have um, in the previous system. So I, and I, I don't want to make it sound like I'm saying that things are perfect. I think there are still issues with attitudes, there are still issues with training, there are still issues with culture, but it is significantly better than it was in terms of the experience that we're hearing about from, from people across Scotland. And the role of the National Rape Task Force is critical in yeah. monitoring that and making sure that that sort of continuous improvement um, continues, essentially. Yeah, no, to... absolutely, it's critical. Okay. Any more components? Yes, uh, Elena. Um, yeah, just briefly, I would say from a local government um, perspective on it as well, um, having that single police force has actually enabled us at a local level to to look at tackling violence against women um, in our partnerships at you know, and local councils and also embed that as a strategic priority within our community planning partnerships and um, strategic aims. Um, and that is the, you know, the police force speaking with that one voice and actually taking that right down to local level. So we're seeing a really good um, move that way as well. Because There's a very that. strong message yes. being able to come out. Definitely. Any other um, questions in that aspect? Can I ask about communication that appears in, in some of the, um, the submissions within the police force and, and within... Um, the day-to-day -day running of, of Police Scotland. Uh, would you like to comment on that? It comes up in your submission, I think. And did it come up in your cipher? I'm not sure if it did. Nick, communication. Yes, yeah. I, um, so I suppose what, what we looked at were elements of kind of internal communication and external communication. I think the internal communication, there was um, a strong sense from particularly kind of local policing teams that... Um, that communication was relatively poor, that they that they felt that there was a lot of emphasis on kind of what needed to change and how that needed to change, but less emphasis on, on why that change was happening. And I think officers felt that they would like to know a lot more about why particular changes were being um, introduced. Um, so, so, yeah, there was a strong sense that, that communication could be done better. I, I, Obviously, it's a question of striking the right balance. Because I think sometimes they felt there was a kind of information overload that they were being kind of overwhelmed with, with you know, new procedures, new protocols, and so on. Um, and and also, I think there was a, an issue about the balance between face-to-face -face communication and electronic communication. So, partly because of the restructuring, I think local officers sometimes felt more remote from their more senior colleagues, and and so there was less kind of day-to-day -day interaction with kind of local commanders in some areas. Um, in terms of external communication, again, I think there was a feeling in the early stages of reform that um, Police Scotland didn't 
place enough priority on consultation and engagement that it embarked on a whole series of changes that had implications for um, for other organisations, but that's beginning to change. That there's now a, st a stronger movement towards consultation. Right. Okay. Any other on um, um, communication? Happy with that. I, I think. Uh, was there anything in the FBU um, communication? Was that an issue at all, Denise? Suppose just pick up on that point that internally, because we have amalgamated eight brigades yeah. into one, the the information, uh, uh, the vast amount of information that comes quickly over policies, procedures, uh, new processes, it's very, very difficult for individuals within the organisation to grasp that, take it on board, learn from it before something else comes in. So it's about the speed of that information coming through. It's quite constant. We've got about... Ivor? Oh, um, pick up on Denise's point. I think Nick covered the... I think frustrations about communications, internal communications, it's one of these things. You say they're a a feast or a famine, I think, regardless of which way you do it. I think there have been issues for the, the senior executives about how they get um, messages out to a big organisation that are both authentic and informative and include people so that they feel and understand the why we're doing things um, because the messages can be quite complex um, and the balance between posting messages on an intranet vis-a-vis face-to-face conversations, which we know are the most effective. So there is something about using the chain of command and briefing appropriately all the way down to the organisation so that people really do feel that they are still part of the police family rather than an employee um, and being told um, just what to do and how to do it through standard operating procedures and so on and so forth. I think there's also an issue about we've had two wide scale staff surveys. Um, we've had within the superintendent association three surveys. There's, there's more survey results coming in. Um, I think it's really imperative that the service um, listens to what comes out of those surveys and is seen to do something quickly. Um, if you ask a question of your workforce but don't respond or not seem to respond, then that's almost worse than not asking the question in the first place. So I think it's really imperative that the, the listening and the learning organisation element of it gathers pace so that the workforce see that they are being listened to. I think that's key to communication. I think the communication and the listening to and responding, getting back, has been a key um, theme we've heard from the Scottish Police Federation for people that are out there on a day-to-day -day basis in the front line. So, point went ahead. Uh, Mike? I'd just to add, um, from my perspective, in terms of communications, which I kind of touched upon just before, is it really the, the need to maintain police confidence and assurance and, and local policing uh, throughout local communities. And I, I think it's one of the lessons we've learned, or ex what we've experienced over the last five years is not having a, a su no surprise agenda in respect that local authorities are engaged, genuinely engaged at an early stage. So there's no potential national policy or priorities that emerge from Police Scotland that cause alarm or you know, con the controversies I've, I've mentioned earlier to local government. So it's really having enhancing upon that. And I suppose it's obviously something that we're working with partners to address that. And it's, it's been encouraging recently to hear uh, the newly appointed Chief Constable Ian Livingston say about the need to engage better with local communities and to look at devolving policing as well. <coughs> yeah, thank you for that. Um, we've got about five or eight minutes so or left. We've, we've exhausted our questions, but I'd like to go around and ask the panellists if there was one thing that you would really like to highlight and, and flag up to us today moving forward um, as we look at this post-legislative scrutiny. What would that be? And... Where will I start? Let's start with you, Denise. Yeah, no problem. Um, this is a lot more detail within our report, but I think it's important for us to flag up the need to have response times and response standards. Uh, previously, we had times when a fire engine left a fire station to go to an incident, and that really helped to keep the infrastructure there. It really helped to keep the amount of fire stations, the amount of firefighters, personnel there. Those standards have gone. We need to have response standards back within the Fire and Rescue Service in order to make sure that the public um, are being provided by a world-class Fire and Rescue Service for public safety and for firefighter safety. And we'll have a lot more detail within that within our submission. OK, thank you for that. Sandy? Um, I, th I think the issue 
that might be helpful to raise that I haven't touched on so far is in relation to forensic responses in terms mm -hmm. of sexual offences, which obviously cuts across the single force and health and the Scottish Government. And I would say that's an area where progress has been much, much slower than it should be. We still have people being examined in police stations, people waiting two days after rape to be examined, people being examined routinely by male doctors. Um, so I, I think the, the difficulty that I see is where an issue falls between different agencies. It falls between the police, it falls between health, it also falls between government departments within the Scottish Government. Uh, there's obviously a responsibility for the SP there as well. So I think that is, that there is progress underway just now under the CMO's task force, but I do think it's something to put a marker down that I really think we need to see urgent action on because the current approach, I think, isn't acceptable. OK, thank you. Nick? Um, I think probably just to reiterate a point I made earlier, I think we just need to go back to those policing principles and make those to be at the heart of policing. You know, it's got to be about community wellbeing, it's got to be about working in, in partnership, um, and part of that is is constantly reviewing that relationship between centralism and localism. I mean, it is something which I don't think we got right in the early stages of reform. I think it's something where we're definitely there, we're moving in the right direction in terms of greater local empowerment of local commanders, having a stronger local voice of local scrutiny committees. So I think continuing in that direction um, makes a lot of sense. Okay, thank you. Um, Ivor. Um, <clears throat> I would say that the, we have a workforce of women and men who are um, vocationally driven, dedicated, professional, um, committed, um, who turn up to work day in, day out and want to do a fantastic job. I think the, um, the key part for me is that now that we've sort of dealt with a lot of the practices and processes and so on and so forth over the last five years, we need to really change the organisational culture which says that we'll listen to our people, we will invest in them, we will give them training and development, and we totally empower and unleash them to give of their best every day to serve the citizens of Scotland. I think if we can couple that, that vision, that sentiment, that um, sense of um, police family, along with the technical excellence that we now have in, in many areas, then I think we will have a police service that will be the, the envy of the world. Um, so I think that, for me, is the key step forward. OK, thank you. Uh, Elena? Um, it's just to echo some of what Nick said and what previously Mike has just said. I think key for us really is the open lines of communication um, directly with local government. Um, and if we can get that right um, with the, the police scrutiny um, forums and um, cascade that up the way as opposed to cascading down the way, I think that we're, we're going to be doing really well. Right. And Mike? Yeah, just to think, like, it's also about genuine partnership working at a national and local level, and that national policy priorities don't necessarily always override uh, local priorities. Uh, and that's working with uh, SFRS and, and Police Scotland, and also ensuring that to uh, maintain police confidence local and assurance with the police and SFRS is effective performance reporting, and also um, information sharing effectively at a local level as well between community plan and partners as well as part of the wider community safety agenda. Okay, can I thank you all very much for attending. That's been a very uh, worthwhile opening session to this important post-legislative scrutiny. So thank you all very much for your submissions and for taking part today. Uh, we're now going to suspend to allow for a change of witnesses and a five-minute comfort break.
Agenda item three is an evidence session on the proposed integration of the British Transport Police in Scotland into Police Scotland. And I welcome Hamza Yusuf, Cabinet Secretary for Justice, and his official Donna Bell, Deputy Director, Police Division, Scottish Government. I refer members to paper two, which is a private paper. Cabinet Secretary, do you wish to make a short opening statement? If I can. Thank you yes, very much certainly. and good morning, uh, convener and uh, committee. I'd like to thank committee for inviting me to speak today and again put on record my sincere thanks to the ongoing commitment of officers and staff of both police services. Uh, this is a challenging and complex piece of work and considerable work has been done to assess the risks, the opportunities and the challenges that full integration presents. The safety and security of the travelling public is absolutely paramount and we cannot and will not allow that to be compromised in any way. The Scotland Act 2016 devolved railway policing powers to Scotland. Our aim has always been to use the devolved powers to ensure that railway policing in Scotland is accountable through the Chief Constable of Police Scotland and the Scottish Police Authority to the people of Scotland. This government was clear that full integration was our aim for the devolution of railway policing, as it would deliver a single command structure for policing in Scotland, with the benefits that are provided uh, for by seamless policing operations across the railway and indeed the wider community. Uh, the purpose of the replanning exercise announced by my predecessor in February was to, specify, to specifically flush out issues and identify when a fully integrated, high quality service could be delivered. This has been a very important piece of work. Indeed, some of the evidence that has emerged has certainly deepened my understanding of the issues of Clearly, which I, I must now give serious and appropriate consideration to. I've always listened to our stakeholders, and that is why, upon the recent advice from Police Scotland, I decided to explore all options available for interim arrangements. There is a pressing need to identify interim arrangements that can give effect more quickly to the Smith Commission's cross-party recommendation to devolve railway policing to the Scottish Parliament. Crucial to this must be the relationship between railway policing and the railway industry. As both the funder and recipient of railway policing services, the railway industry's interests are, of course, central. A railway operator should be fully involved in setting railway policing priorities and objectives for Scotland. And I'm clear that before full integration may be realised, there are benefits to considering an interim solution that still meets the recommendations and indeed the spirit of the Smith Commission. The due diligence report commissioned by Police Scotland identified that the provisional cost of current railway policing in Scotland is 21.9 million for financial year 2018. This includes approximately 9.5 million of indirect costs to BTP centralised functions, which Scotland directly contributes to. I believe there's an opportunity to leverage this position for a fairer deal for Scotland in policing our railways and consider a uniquely Scottish funding model. And this could have a number of benefits, providing greater clarity for the rail industry about ongoing costs, a more transparent service agreement with greater input from Scottish stakeholders and the potential for an enhanced productivity model. Over the last few years, uh, other options had been given consideration, uh, including detailed proposals from the BTP and, and BTPA. Uh, given that we now need to look at interim arrangements, it is only right that we revisit these options uh, and indeed any others and give them due consideration. Uh, we undertake a rigorous, uh, rigorous scrutiny uh, and we test these with stakeholders and indeed professionals. It is imperative that Police Scotland, uh, the SPA, BTP and BTPA are part of that process. And I'm delighted that all partners have committed to undertaking this work. I'm keen to bring all stakeholders together to fully consider options available for interim arrangements, and my officials are organising this as a, a matter of urgency. Uh, to conclude, convener, I fully recognise that this next phase of work still provides a degree, of course, of uncertainty for staff and officers. However, given the recent advice from Police Scotland and the new need to identify interim solutions for the devolution of railway policing, it is crucial that time and consideration is given to these options. But it must be noted uh, that as things stand, th there is no change uh, to officers and staff who will remain the responsibility of the BTPA. Of course, uh, we'll keep committee informed as this work progresses. Okay, thank you. We now move to questions, Rona. Thank you, <coughs> Convener. Um, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, 
The Railway Policing uh, Scotland Act was passed last June by the Scottish Parliament. I wonder if you can tell us what the status of that, um, that current bill is and if you're considering uh, new options, would new legislation be needed? In terms of uh, the current state of that legislation, uh, clearly we're not commencing uh, the, the, the Act and uh, uh, the, the language I, I, try, I, I use in this, whether it was in my parliamentary uh, answers to parliamentary questions or indeed in my statement here, is that we'll keep, com keep that commencement act, uh, date under review um, and we'll continue to do that. Um, clearly, uh, as we begin to explore uh, interim solutions, uh, it depends on what those interim arrangements might well be. Um, clearly, if they, if they avoid legislation, we would have to come back to the Parliament, get agreement with other uh, political parties and, and, and hope to move that forward. But it may well be that we come to a solution, uh, an interim arrangement uh, that doesn't require legislation. Um, but in the meantime, it's important that whatever interim solution we end up uh, agreeing and partners end up agreeing on, um, it is important that that is given time to see whether or not that fulfils the ambitions that we all have in terms of railway policing vis-à-vis -vis the Smith Commission. And, um, uh, of course, as I say, we will keep the Act uh, under review. OK, thank you. Sorry, can I just in your opening statement, can you... Um, I think I, I just m didn't hear exactly what you said about the amount of money that British Transport Police get from Scotland. So... I mean, Twenty one point nine million is the is, is the figure in relation to the, the costs uh, that the the, the, the the railway industry uh, pays for services for for railway policing. But it should be noted that nine point five million uh, pounds of that directly contributes from Scotland to, to centralised services. And, and and there's a view there, and I think this was expressed during the various evidence sessions that uh, this committee took in relation to the the integration of of, of BTP that there may be. Uh, uh, possibility of, of, of revisiting that and at least seeing we can potentially get a, a fairer deal uh, on that. Okay, thank you. John Finney. Uh, thank you, um, Convener. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, you, you described it as challenging and complex. You, you highlighted the importance of public safety. Um, both of these things were at the forefront of <clears throat> considerations when this committee put considerable time into uh, looking at this legislation. Do you feel let down by Police Scotland? No, no, Police Scotland gave me the best advice that they could at the time, gave this committee the best advice uh, that, they, that they could. And clearly, uh, once you begin the, 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 the uh, deep dive into some of this work, into the detail of that work, uh, and I should say from the offset, Police Scotland have always said, and always did say, that they would not commence that work uh, until, of course, the will of Parliament uh, was determined. And that, that's right not to presume the will of Parliament. Um, and, and then, of course, having done that work now, having engaged in the various specialists and, and, and the expertise, uh, these issues have come to the fore. And Police Scotland uh, did the right thing by informing uh, me and my officials uh, of, of the fact that they were unable to give a date uh, for integration. And that, uh, I think, is the right and prudent thing to do for, for me and government to have updated Parliament to, and this committee to that effect. And uh, as I say, to, to, to look at the other options that are available. But no, I don't, I don't feel let down by Police Scotland. You've clearly failed to deliver on this legislation. Are you confident that the Scottish Government provided this committee with all the information that's led us to this point? Yes, without a shadow of a doubt. Uh, we were acting, of course, on, on, on the best advice that we were being given. Uh, that advice has, has changed, but it has changed based on the detailed work that Police Scotland have done. Uh, it has changed based on that detailed examination, uh, you know, of, of, of a merger, of an as you would do with, with almost any merger or, or, or integration. Uh, and I think that is absolutely right that Police Scotland have come to us uh, with that. Now, am I, am I disappointed that we're, we're at this stage and we're not able to push ahead with full integration? Because I see the benefits of full integration, seamless policing, that uh, single command structure, and I see those benefits. Uh, so if the question is, am, am I disappointed? Uh, yes, yes, I've said that in my answer to, to parliamentary questions, but I have an absolute duty to ensure that, first and foremost, the public are kept safe and travelling public are protected. But secondly, I have an absolute uh, duty, I believe, to try to give effect to the Smith Commission uh, as quickly and as practically as possible. Yes, but that's the singular thing you failed to do. And I think we all agreed that public safety was of paramount and also the terms and conditions of the officers and staff affected by this. Again, you failed to, to deliver the necessary assurances there some considerable time into the process. What I want to ask you about, Cabinet Secretary, is, is clearly it's identified that there's a democratic deficit. Effectively, we have a police service operating in Scotland that is not accountable to this parliament, that's not accountable to this committee. 
And we've seen in recent times, for instance, significant police operations about disorder at stations. The incident fairly recently where there was uh, significant disorder in, in the Ayrshire coast. It's Police Scotland that were involved in these, primarily in these operations. We can scrutinise Police Scotland. We can't scrutinise that force. I would agree with the, 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 the members, uh, and almost, well, I agree with the member, actually, that the most pressing issue for me is... Yes, the safety in Parliament, that is everybody here, the, the, the safety of the travelling public, but the democratic deficit in relation to accountability to this Parliament, uh, for me, is, is, is the most pressing matter. So, therefore, when stakeholders do meet, when they do gather around the table, when they do explore all the other options, I've got no doubt at all that addressing that accountability deficit that currently exists, as the member articulates well, I think, uh, it will be at the forefront of everybody's mind. Thank you. Daniel. <clears throat> Excuse me, Daniel. Thank you, convener. Um, if I may, I'd just like to quote from the, 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 one of the papers at the, from the recent SPA board meeting, um, which states, in essence, the current BTP and Police Scotland systems are incompatible, and Police Scotland's wider ICT transformation, which could increase compatibility, is only at the planning stage, with the delivery of the improved system being several years away. I'm just wondering if this is one of the major points which prevents um, the implementation of full integration. I'm just wondering why it was a surprise uh, uh, that, that the Police Scotland's ICT transformation was at a stage that would prevent integration of BTP systems? I think anybody that has dealt with the integration of ICT systems, and I don't presume to know whether the member has or hasn't, knows that these are complex matters. Uh, they are, you know, if it could be, and it could have been determined beforehand that uh, uh, BTP's uh, systems and, and, and Police Scotland systems uh, were, were not compatible or, or would not be able to be made compatible in, term, in time for, for full integration, then clearly we would have arrived at that conclusion. And Police Scotland's advice to me at that point and to this committee, in fact, uh, would have been different. But clearly uh, it wasn't once the, uh, as I say, the detailed work could have been done, and it is right that Police Scotland didn't presume the will of Parliament on this, uh, then, then that was the right thing to, to, to have done. So I, I can understand members' frustrations, and please accept that I'm also frustrated at where we are. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, if that is the advice coming from Police Scotland, the prudent thing for me to do is to accept that advice and see what other interim uh, arrangements uh, can come forward. If it's helpful for to, the, to the member, I mean, through the committee, uh, we can give a little bit more detail about some of those ICT integration issues. They are um, and in some respects, uh, fairly complex, as you can imagine, uh, ICT issues tend to be. But nonetheless, uh, if the committee would find that interesting uh, or insightful, uh, then we can uh, provide some of that information. I mean, it strikes me that this is the sort of detail which is pretty critical in terms of developing a business case uh, for any form of integration. In retrospect, do you not feel that that business case should have been developed prior to the introduction of this legislation rather than doing it afterwards? So we published a case to, to the UK government about integration of BTP and, 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 and Police Scotland. Uh, but as I said, I think if, for example, the police had spent the time and the resource, uh, and in essence the government had also, presuming the will of Parliament, and Parliament had not passed the Railway Policing Act, then rightly this committee would be the first to bring Police Scotland and indeed I'm sure the government to, to account for spending that resource and spending that time and presuming the will of Parliament, even though they hadn't passed the, 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 the legislation. So uh, I think on, ref on reflection, I do come to this, I mean, I don't come to this committee uh, bullish in any sense. I mean, I, I come, of course, with a degree of humility. And what I would say is that there's clearly a space in between not presuming the will of Parliament uh, and, and doing that uh, deep dive and detailed analysis to get us to a point uh, which, which would have served us better, I think, uh, than, than where we happen to be. So, so neither ourselves or, or, or I imagine, and I don't speak for Police Scotland, but I imagine any other stakeholders, uh, you know, we, we, we would rather not be in this position. But we are faced with the advice that we're being given, that is changing advice uh, from Police Scotland. I accept uh, the reasons that Police Scotland uh, have given to me uh, on the challenges, and therefore it's incumbent that I find those interim arrangements that can give uh, assurance, uh, especially around the issues around uh, accountability. So, so just, I mean, given that statement in the paper uh, from the last SPA board meeting, 
I mean, do you agree with the, the conclusion from that, uh, that extends from that, that really full integration won't even be possible for several years and only once uh, the, the Police Scotland's ICT transformation has been fully implemented? Uh, look, having spoken to, to, to Police Scotland, uh, the SPA, and of course I'll, I'll look forward to, to talking to and speaking to other partners uh, very soon on this, that many people look at policing 2026 as being the natural dovetail point of full integration, uh, which, as I say, is being kept under, un, under review. I would disagree with that uh, assessment. Uh, it is not where my focus is at the moment. My focus isn't on the full integration piece. I've been given advice from Police Scotland, which says that full integration, uh, they cannot give a definitive date for. So therefore, my attention, uh, the government's attention, and I've suggested this to stakeholders, of course, that all our attention should be on finding those interim solutions which deal with the accountability question that John Finney uh, rightly raises and also ensures that we continue to maintain safety for the travelling public in our railways. Yeah, uh, I, I should probably roll back. We were the committee that um, looked at this legislation, as you know, Cabinet Secretary, and unusually we divided on it. So it wasn't um, legislation that we were all absolutely 100% happy it had been got right. So I wonder if you could give us some more information about what changed in February 2018. You mentioned some reasons given by... Um, Police Scotland, mm. IT has been highlighted. What else? Mm. I hope I've never given the impression, uh, convener, that uh, th this was a universally co popular course of, of action we were taking. I understand that. I was in the committee sessions and in the various uh, debates that, that were taking uh, place. Uh, what I would say is, um, previously I say, out outlined in the justice to the Justice Committee, uh, the, the, the MTT, uh, the Mobilisation uh, Transition and, and Transformation Project, was established in October 2017. Uh, the purpose of that was to support the delivery uh, of the operational aspects of the integration between Police Scotland, uh, British Transport Police, sorry, and, and, and Police Scotland. Uh, this was led jointly by Police Scotland and, and BTPA. Uh, the joint work that was carried out uh, by both bodies reviewed progress on the operational uh, matters in February 2018, and at that point concluded that a number of significant issues remain to be resolved. And therefore, that advice was then fed into the Joint Programme Board, who were advised that further time was needed to deliver integration uh, most effectively for, for, as I say, the safety of, of railway passengers. So really, it came from that joint piece of work being done by, by Police Scotland, BTPA, under the MTT. And that then, of course, then advised the J Joint Programme Board, which, which um, clearly, from operational perspective, uh, more time was needed. OK. Can I delve a little bit further? Mm -hmm. Why weren't these developments identified previously in the specialist integration due diligence analysis, analysis carried out by Ernst & Young at a cost of um, £298,000? Why weren't they really, really acted on once they'd been identified? I think, um, I suppose a couple of things. The obvious point would be that because this is the Ensign Young contract, you're, you're referring to the 298,000. Um, I would refer the committee to Police Scotland, um, who obviously commissioned the due, due, due diligence uh, analysis. However, my understanding um, it refers actually to my previous answer, uh, really, that um, the due diligence work focused primarily on, on, on the cost of railway policing. So that would be on things like the assets, the liabilities, the fleet, the property, and so on and so forth. Uh, that would be relevant as part of full integration. It didn't focus on the operational issues. So what I referred to in my previous answer, and I hopefully put some emphasis on this, was the, the operational aspects that the MTT was considering. So that wouldn't have come out in the due diligence piece of work, which was very much focused, as I say, on the, uh, on, on the assets and liabilities. But we're now three years down the line. Why has it taken so long? Well, well again, I, I go back to my, my, my previous answers that... Um, I completely agree with Police Scotland when they came in front of this committee, and I think it was ACC Higgins who said that they would, they would not presume the will of Parliament. Uh, so clearly the, the, the work of the Joint Programme Board, the detailed analysis, um, for which you need specialists and, 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 and for which uh, specialists have been, have been drafted in, uh, it would be presumptuous uh, until, that part, until that act was passed by Parliament to do uh, that, that work and to spend that resource and to spend that time. But as I said in my answer to Daniel Johnson, clearly there are lessons to be learnt here. And I think there's a 
bit of reflection to be done about that space, about not presuming the will of Parliament, but yet doing the detailed analysis that, that, that needs to be done without, as I say, pr pr presuming uh, the, the will of Parliament. So I, I, I'm reflecting on that, and clearly I would hope all partners would reflect on that too. Liam Kerr. Uh, the consultants, if I may, Cabinet Secretary. So uh, in terms of the <coughs> work that was produced by EY at a cost of 298,000, was that uh, something... So had they missed something such that when it came as a surprise to everyone uh, in, in or around February, uh, or was there a failure to instruct them uh, in terms of the work scope sufficiently? And it, I suppose I would go back to my, my previous answer around uh, presumption of, of, of the will of Parliament. So if the question is, could they have done that work before? I think all of us, uh, you know, certainly I should say from, from, from opposition, would have questioned why they were spending a fairly significant resource uh, on, on, on a piece of work that hadn't been um, uh, signed off by the Parliament, hadn't been agreed by, by the majority of Parliament. So there's a question there around spending that money. I think the other thing to say is that the, there's two contracts for the E&Y piece of work and there can sometimes be a conflation between the two contracts and my answer to, to the convener, some of that work of course was on the assets and liabilities, just as you would do in, in almost any merger, if you can imagine any merger, you would, you would look at the, the, the assets and liabilities uh, that, 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 that the organisations have. Uh, so that, that work was done. So, so uh, you know, again, is there a reflective space whereby some of this detailed examination could have been done? Uh, in advance of this stage. That is something that I'm reflecting very hard on. So, the, the, just so I'm absolutely clear, if I may, Cabinet Secretary, so that there are two scopes of work that EY are taking. One costs 298,000 and relates to assets and liabilities. The other, I think, is about 400,000. Uh, could you just clarify what that refers to? And then there's another consultant which comes through Harvey Nash Recruitment. Uh, could you tell us the scope of work that this third consult or second consultant with a third work scope is undertaking? Sure. So, as I say, one piece, uh, and, and I suppose these are questions for Police Scotland, but I'll give you my, my, my best understanding, of course. For the one Ernst and Young contract is the one that I've referred to in my answer to the convener, which is one on due diligence. That is the assets and liabilities, the fleet, the property, all of that, just as you would with, with any merger. The second, uh, and I'll maybe ask Donna Bell to come in with a little bit more detail, but the second one looks at uh, essentially programme support, um, looking at targeted, targeted uh, operating models um, and so on and, and, and so forth. And I'll ask Donna to, to come in in a second on that. In terms of our own uh, the question around the Harvey, Harvey, Harvey Nash consultant, uh, again, that is very much programme support um, and, and, and very specialist support uh, in, in, in that regard. And that, uh, uh, the costs of that, uh, I think we've answered in a, in, in a parliamentary question. Um, but uh, so far, the, that consultant has done uh, 260 days of work, uh, which totally uh, approximate uh, total is around £60,000 that's been spent on that consultant. But if it's helpful, I can bring Donna on the, on, on the second EY contract. Uh, she'll be able to give a little bit more detail on that. Yep, happy to do so. Um, as Mr Yusuf says, um, Ernst & Young were involved throughout the replanning. Um, this is a very complex programme, um, and they brought their specific programme management specialist skills to the Police Scotland end of that. Um, in terms of the Scottish Government's um, interim professional advisor, which is the, effectively what that consultant is. Um, that person has worked to coordinate the programme, um, as well as working with partners to develop the target operating model. And there are a range of work streams that have fallen out of that. Um, but effectively, it's a coordination role um, and a role that seeks to secure, um, I suppose, the detailed parts of the target operating model and the timeline for the programme. So, <clears throat> two questions, if I may. Will the scope and outputs from these consultants be made publicly available, and if so, when? Uh, and secondly, in terms of the remuneration of these consultants, is the contract, so, uh, is it a, a fixed fee contract? So EY will take 298,000 for this scope of work, uh, or is it a rolling contract such that they build time in line such that the longer this carries on, the more money the public purse will pay to them. Okay, on, on the second question, I might ask Donna if she has slightly more detail. I know from our own consultant, remember we are talking about, you know, essentially three contracts, two from Police 
the Scotland, for, excuse me, and, and, and one from the Scottish Government. So um, some of the detail might have to come from, from Police Scotland in terms of the procurement process that is, that is used. Certainly my understanding on your second question from the government's uh, consultant from Harvey Nash that it is on a rolling basis. Um, but, but I'll ask again, Donna, to, to, to confirm that in a second. In relation to your first question around what can be made publicly uh, uh, available, I suppose two things. One I would say is that the work that is being carried out whatever option we end up going with in the interim, this work that we're doing will carry us in, in, in good stead. I think whatever option we go with, um, so that, that, that there's an element that that work will, will come in useful. In terms of um, making it publicly available, uh, if the member won't mind, I'll, I'll, I'll take that um, offline and, and look at that request with an absolute open mind. I think we should make that, that work available where it's possible in, in, in as widely a transparent format as possible. He, he may understand there might well be sensitivities around personal individ individuals' personal information in terms of the consultant being involved or um, potential commercial sensitivities and other such things. But uh, uh, where, I, where I can make that uh, information publicly available as widely and as transparently as possible, uh, then, I, then I have no issues in doing so. Uh, just one final thing then. So we've talked a lot about the uh, cost of the external consultants, but uh, Cabinet Secretary, do you have, as at today's date, any estimate on the total costs that have been spent to date on uh, staff time, on consultants, on SPA time, on Police Scotland, other consultancies? Do we have a global figure yet? Sure. I think that would be difficult because you're, you're asking me to, to, to um, somehow conjure up uh, specifics around other stakeholder staff time. I wouldn't be able to give you that information. Uh, you would have to ask those in, those, those individual organisations for the, the staff time. And even from a government point of view, when we give estimate figures of staff time, and we have given that to the Justice Committee in, in a letter to the convener, uh, which is which is I think publicly available, that uh, they are crude estimates. We are working and basing that on the fact uh, of the officials involved their salary, salary, salary levels um, and, and a, an approximation of how much time they are devoting to this project. But of course, they devote time to many other projects in government uh, also. So uh, we can give you certainly staff figures and crude estimations of st staff figures from the Scottish Government. Uh, we've been able to get them from the DFT as well, which again, we've passed on to, to, to the convener. And we're able to give you consultancy costs and you can add all of that together. But does that give you a truly global figure where you'd have to speak to uh, clearly other partners and other stakeholders to gather from them the, the, the cost and the staff cost involved in this project. Uh, I wonder, Cabinet Secretary, um, the independent watchdog report on the BTP in Scotland proposed integration stated that the Scottish Government failed to set out a single detailed and authoritative business case. Are you in a position to do that now? Yeah, well, as I said, we, we published the case to, to the UK government uh, initially, I think it was in 2013, uh, and, and, and I've spoken at length, I think, in committee or indeed in parliamentary debates around why uh, we think uh, full integration uh, has uh, benefits. I've talked and touched upon uh, some of that, uh, but clearly, uh, as the JPB partners uh, and others uh, are giving their detailed analysis and consideration, uh, clearly there are issues being being flushed out and that's only right and that is the purpose of the joint program board um, so yes we have a case uh, that, that, that um, and, and, and and we have uh, given much detail I think over the years on why we think full integration is beneficial but I would say to the convener that that is not where my focus currently is currently if my, the advice from police Scotland is that they cannot give me and cannot determine a date for full integration, then my focus is very much on the interim arrangements. But presumably, then, the business case is something that is constantly under review and will be looked at again, because already we've heard the, the costs from consultants firing well, um, my, other, mm, other uh, aspects affecting, affecting. Yeah, no, sure. I think it's a very reasonable question to ask in my direction to my government officials and um, this has also been shared with other partners, is that the work on full integration should be paused. So the work on full integration should be paused while we focus our attention on what are the interim arrangements. Because again, and as my answer to, to Daniel Johnson, um, that is a, a long, full integration is a long-term goal that will be kept under review. Therefore, the immediate focus must be on what those interim arrangements would be. Now, given this was the independent watchdog's report, 
Can I ask you about the other two major points that, that he raised? There was a total lack of thought regarding the fact that the proposals would lead to a dual command structure for railway policing across Great Britain. Uh, well, again, for me, the benefits uh, very much outweigh that. The, 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 the single command structure in Scotland uh, would have been of, of, of great benefit, and I still believe would be of great uh, benefit, and that's the benefit you would have had with full integration. Uh, so my belief is, is, is very much that uh, the benefits that we would have seen in Scotland of full integration would have outweighed any of the negatives. So what are the benefits as, as you see them, given that presumably, um, and it would be good if you confirmed this, that safety and the safety uh, that has been maintained by BTP is absolutely paramount in whatever um, hmm. arrangement trans uh, transfers. Uh, again, I think these are, are, are well rehearsed from, from, from the government's point of view. We've talked about seamless policing, we've talked about the single command structure, we've talked about the fact that if they were integrated, Police Scotland could, if I remember the phrase correctly, quote unquote, routinely deploy Police Scotland officers, uh, therefore using that pool of resource of police officers uh, right across our rail network, enhancing uh, the, the, the safety for the travelling public. Uh, and indeed, uh, when, when ACC Higgins was, 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 was here and giving evidence and other Police Scotland uh, officials were, were, officers were giving uh, evidence, they often talked about, <coughs> excuse me, the enhanced training that every Police Scotland officer uh, would have uh, in relation to 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 to, to, the, to, our, to Scotland's railways, so I think there was many benefits, and there are continue to be many benefits of full integration. But I would press the point uh, once again, uh, convener, um, that is uh, the the long term goal that has been kept under review, and I, I emphasise that my immediate focus uh, now is very much trying to find the interim uh, solutions and the interim arrangements, and, and for that we'll consult with um, and, and discuss with uh, stakeholders and indeed wherever there are good ideas, uh, I'll be uh, open to, to listening to those. And if I could just press, press you on the very last point that HMICS made was that the specialist and distinct nature of BTP's work has been underestimated. Uh, I would completely disagree with that point. Uh, I've always said, whether it's to BTP direct or indeed to this committee, that um, certainly in my time as Minister for Transport, I could see uh, how expert uh, BTP officers were. Um, for example, uh, whenever there was, uh, um, and unfortunately, uh, as there too often was a, a suicide on the line, they were uh, extremely sensitive and professional in terms of uh, clearing that situation in the best way possible uh, and, and to the minimal disruption of service. So they had a, a, they had and have uh, a very high reputation in the rail industry. I saw that firsthand from, from my conversations as Minister for Transport and from a government point of view, uh, I've ever, never, ever underestimated uh, their uh, expertise uh, and, and that was never a threat or risk. I would argue with full integration, but as I continue to say, um, that is not where the immediate focus is. The immediate focus is very much on uh, finding those interim arrangements. Yeah, but if I could just make this last comment, then um, I think the evidence we were receiving is that some of that specialism was leaving BTP because of all the other things that had not had been resolved. So while you you recognise, and um, I think that's that's um, very encouraging the specialism and have given examples of how essential it is, then if there's a hemorrhaging of that specialism because of what's happened, surely there's a problem here. Yeah, but again, that was based, I think, on, on, on staff surveys, perhaps, that you're, you're, you're quoting. But, uh, you know, we would want uh, those officers to remain. Uh, we see them absolutely as being vital to the efficient and safe running of, of the railway industry. And as I say, I wouldn't take away from that. So uh, never has there been an uh, an underestimation at all of, of the very vital service that the British Transport Police uh, provides. And, and, and the reason for full integration was that we believed we could uh, have an enhancement uh, of that service, not a, not a detriment. Okay. Liam Kerr, then Liam MacArthur. Just very briefly, if I may, <coughs> you stated a few times that integra full integration remains the long-term goal, and that's despite the various criticisms from across the spectrum. Uh, so how do you respond to the suggestion that you're starting from a position of full integration and working backwards to find the benefits uh, and to find out how to get there, rather than what would seem to me to be the sensible approach, which, going back to John Finney's question earlier, is to say, well, 
OK, we need to deliver public safety above all. We need to de deliver... Uh, we need the best product to come out. We need the most appropriate thing to the public purse. Now, what is the model that, that will deliver that? So, uh, I wouldn't necessarily see the two as being mutually exclusive. And the reason I say that is uh, the two approaches is mutually exclusive. The, the reason I say that is because we have passed the, the, the Railway Policing Act um, in, 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 in this parliament. Uh, we have there um, the legislative framework needed for, for full integration. Um, what interim solutions we come up with, of course, we'll, we'll, we'll um, uh, continue to keep committee uh, appraised of that. But it could be that um, we get to a position <clears throat> where the interim arrangements satisfy us universally, the political parties around this table, the stakeholders involved, and we believe that after a period of, of, of a couple or a few years of, 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 of those arrangements being in place, that we are universally satisfied um, that uh, the accountability deficit has been demonstrated, that we have the best model in place, not just to maintain the safety, but indeed enhance the safety of the travelling public. And if we got to that point, um, frankly, we would have to look again at whether the legislation would be commenced or not. Uh, that would be one position. Uh, the other position may be that we come to some interim arrangements, but as a parliament, uh, as stakeholders, we recognise that there could be enhanced benefits from full integration at a timescale determined by the partners, Police Scotland, BTPA, so on and so forth. And therefore, it would be prudent to keep that legislative framework in place and not repeal the Act or not, uh, for example, change that legislative framework. So therefore, uh, for me, the prudent way of approaching this would be to examine and explore what options there are for interim uh, arrangements to give effect and best effect to the letter of the Smith Commission, but also the spirit of the Smith Commission in terms of railway policing. Give it a period of time, and that can be open to discussion, and I'd be keen to, to hear from other political parties uh, on that. And therefore, keep that under review, hence why I keep using the language that is a long-term goal that is being kept, and the Act and the commencement of the Act is something that I keep under review. I, I am not uh, close-minded on that point, but I still uh, continue to, to, to say, that from a government point of view, from a Scottish government point of view, we still see some benefits uh, in, in, in full integration, uh, hence why it is something that we'll keep under review. But uh, again, I stress that my immediate focus is on finding those interim arrangements that can hopefully give effect to Smith. Okay, thank you. We've got another supplementary from Liam MacArthur, Rona, and then we'll be moving on to Shona. Thanks very much, Convener. Can I start with an apology, Cabinet Secretary, for being late? I was down at another committee moving amendments to, uh, to a bill. You've restated um, the rationale behind um, the decisions you, um, you, you took in relation to the integration of BTP with Police Scotland. Um, you'll recall there were many of us that questioned why other options were not being explored uh, at the outset rather than uh, where we appear to be uh, now. Given that um, there is this pause um, in the commencement of legislation we've already passed. Um, we've seen uh, legislation passed in the last parliament that's had to be repealed in, in this parliament. And other examples of where we appear to be legislating at haste and then repenting at le leisure. Do you think there is there are lessons that, that you will take from this experience um, and apply in the way that you take forward other aspects of um, the, the, the parts of the legislative programme for which you have responsibility? Well, certainly, of course, it's, it's, it's a foolish, uh, you know, it'd be foolish of me not to say that uh, there, there are not lessons to, to be learned. Clearly, there are not just for government, uh, but I would say of, of, of all the partners that have, that have been involved, and I think all of us uh, will reflect on that. As I, as I said, I don't know if the member was here or, or, or not, but I don't, I don't come to this committee bullish. I, you know, I understand that there's a degree of humility uh, needed in, in, in these matters, and um, I come very much in that reflective spirit. Uh, what I would say, however, is that we, of course, um, uh, took forward full integration with the best advice that we were being given at that time. And I don't doubt Police Scotland's good advice at that time. They were again basing it um, on, 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 on the best advice uh, that they could provide. Um, but clearly that advice changed. Uh, and therefore we are in the position uh, that we are in uh, now. So yes, um, reflective uh, undoubtedly, um, but also very much a focus on uh, giving effect to the spirit and the letter of the Smith Commission as best I possibly can, and hopefully as quickly as we possibly can but too. 
I mean, I appreciate that, and, and again, apologies for, for um, not being present for your, your earlier comments, and I, and I take what you said in the spirit uh, with which it's conveyed. I, I think the concern I would have in relation to, to this particular example is the advice that you got from Police Scotland seemed to me in the evidence we took from them, advice that had been um, given in response to a very clear steer from um, from ministers and from yourself in particular about where you wanted to go. Now, that's very different from saying, look, here's an open here's an open book. This is this is our our direction of travel. This is where we want to go. What what would be your advice uh, on the best way uh, of uh, of achieving that? It, it seemed. Um, through watching the process, through the evidence that we, we took, that the answer had to be this, and therefore all the evidence that, and, and the advice that you were, were taking was with a view to substantiating and, 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 and um, justifying that approach, rather than saying we're open-minded to how we achieve this, our preference is to go down this route, but we are genuinely open to arguments uh, about other ways of achieving the broad principles laid out by the Smith, uh, Smith Commission mm. and accepted by all of us. So I, I don't think anybody was particularly surprised by our, our um, position on, on, on full integration. It's been a long-standing position for, 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 for many, many years. Um, what we did was base the date on full, of full integration, should it be in April next year, based on the advice that, that we were being given uh, at the time. And I think that advice, as I say, was given in absolutely, um, it was given in, 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 in uh, the best advice possible at that, at that time. Uh, I never, uh, having been involved in, in, in the legislation from the Minister for Transport perspective, never once, uh, you know, uh, had any impression from the police that they were being, as, as perhaps Lee MacArthur is insinuating, if nothing else, uh, being leaned upon uh, at all in terms of the date of, uh, of, of full integration. It was coming from advice that we would uh, uh, we would receive from Police Scotland through close collaboration, close working. Um, but as I say, that advice changed, and um, you know, based on, on on further work that Police Scotland had done, engaging with experts, uh, and, and of course being part of the Joint Programme Board. Uh, which is uh, part of the job, of course, was to flush out some of these issues. So, uh, no, I would reject any, uh, even if it is just an insinuation, that there was any leaning on uh, any stakeholders to, to, to fit a, a timetable for, for, for government. Ron. Thank you, Convener. Um, yes, just on the general principle of integration, I wonder if you would agree that there's a, an element of hypocrisy here, given that last uh, year's Conservative manifesto proposed to create a national infrastructure police force bringing together the Civil Defence uh, Constabulary, the Ministry of Defence Police and the British Transport Police to improve the protection of critical infrastructure such as nuclear sites, railways and strategic road network. So there seems to be a will to do it south of the border for that respect, but there are, there's opposition up here to the general principle of it. As I was, I was doing my best to be as collegiate, collegiate and uh, collaborative uh, in, in that spirit as, as, as possible. And uh, I think, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a point of note, I think, in debate and, and, and even at committee that um, we are not the, the, the only political party to have thought that um, the merging of, of, of police forces uh, was a good idea. And uh, as I say, it's a, a matter of note on the, on, on the record that uh, this was, um, I think, in the Conservatives' 2016 Big manifesto 17, yeah. and, and 17, maybe general election manifesto. Uh, as, as well, but uh, that is just a, a matter of note. I don't know where the UK government are and their plans on that, and, and so on and so forth. But um, mm. uh, yes, I, 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 uh, yes, I would concur that uh, clearly uh, we are not the only ones uh, to believe that there was a, a good idea in merging of forces. Thank you, Shona. I want to pick up on the options. Of, good morning. Uh, in a minute, just just on the ICT issue, just um, I guess just an observation that from experience, I, I know how difficult uh, ICT uh, projects can be, how complex it can be. So I think it would be helpful for the committee to take you up on your offer of mm. some of the detail of those issues, um, how they're going to be resolved, maybe the time frame for that, and. Quite importantly, I think, from experience about the project management of doing so, mm. how is that going to be managed? Because it has to be managed uh, well um, in order to, to resolve those issues. On the issue of options, and just to make sure I'm, I'm understanding this correctly, what you're saying is that um, the, the government is now going to 
look at the options going forward in order to put interim arrangements in place. Now, depending on the success or otherwise of those interim arrangements, that will then um, colour the view of whether or not those interim arrangements stand the, the test of time and become potentially the arrangements going forward. But that you will remain open-minded on that, depending on, on how uh, effective they are. So on those, uh, those options, presumably some of those options will be the ones previously identified back in... Uh, January 2015, but you had hinted in your opening statement that some of those may be new options. And I guess I want to understand a little bit about how those particular those new options will be developed, how it will the, who will be involved in developing those, um, and you know what, if any, uh, you as a cabinet secretary has as, in terms of any preferred option that, that at this stage, or are you completely open-minded on that? Obviously, you've said they have to deliver the, the Smith um, uh, principles, and we all understand that. But whether or not there, there is a, a mm. preferred option at, at this stage, and I suppose lastly, how you will uh, ensure that Parliament and this committee are kept uh, informed and potentially involved, uh, given that the uh, parties represented around this table may have um, options to bring to the table in that regard. Mm. Well, on the very latter point, uh, when we consulted on this, it would be fair to say that I don't think any other political party came forward with actual detailed proposals on alternative uh, arrangements. So, yes, if other parties want to come forward with, with, with models that they are backing firmly, uh, then, then, of course, my door will be very open uh, very much to that. Can I also thank uh, Sean Robinson for... Um, uh, you know the the, the 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 remarks around the ICT and prefacing uh, that because um, anybody that's been involved in ICT integration knows that uh, they can be challenging uh, and they can be they can be complex. But I will certainly endeavour <coughs> as best I can to get a note to to the committee via the convener around um, some of the ICT challenges that, that that exist. It should be said that Police Scotland are are, are building up their 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 case around um, updating the digital infrastructure. Uh, that is an ongoing process, but certainly where I can give information to that, I will, will give you as much information as possible. Um, in terms of um, the other options, uh, I suppose a couple of things I would, I would say. Uh, I think her character, her, 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 her um, uh, summing up of, of my position was absolutely correct in, in terms of the interim arrangements and giving them time to embed and so on and so forth. Uh, what I would say is that uh, for me, virtually no options are, are, should be off the table at this stage. However, where I have a concern around some options is where there is a confusion, uh, potentially, of accountability. So where there's a shared accountability between UK government and Scottish government, that would give me cause for concern, partly because of the confusion, but also I don't think it delivers on the spirit of Smith. The spirit of Smith is to devolve to this parliament, uh, <coughs> therefore be accountable to this parliament, to have uh, another parliament or indeed another, another government involved in that accountability for me would be would be, be the difficult position to reconcile. So um, while not ruling any options out, and I think you know there's there's a number of options that have come forward previously from from BTP, uh, BTPA uh, and others uh, and, 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 and the federation. I think also uh, again we should we should look uh, at what's been suggested. Uh, I know, for example, and I think many people will be aware of of. Uh, academic work done by, by Dr Kath Murray and, and Dr Colin Armstrong, I think it is. Uh, again, we should be open-minded to, to the academics that have come forward with suggestions. We should come be open-minded to stakeholders and we should be open-minded, and I will be open-minded, to other political parties that come forward with suggestions. Uh, the member is right to um, make reference to, to timing mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 and timescales. Uh, that work is, is ongoing and is an immediate uh, I, I would, of course, endeavour to keep Parliament updated. I would hope that I'd be able to give you, um, if not a definitive, at least a, a steer on the direction that the government uh, and partners were going towards before Christmas recess, for example. And I'd be happy to, of course, come to the Parliament and indeed the committee to provide that update. Is that your question's concluded, Yeah, that would Thank be you. good to get I wonder that if update. I could pin you down just a little bit further, um, Cabinet Secretary, given there was only one option on the table and, and 
To be honest, I, I think the, the Scottish Government was very intransigent with this, just going with one option, ignoring all the others. Can I ask you specifically, is the administrative devolution option that um, BTPA and the BTP came up with, is that on the table as an interim option? And is the statutory devolved model of governance and accountability with B BTP BTPA retaining responsibility for railway policing in Scotland also on the table? So uh, I think I answered those in my, my previous uh, answer. While they may remain on the table, I would have some concerns because of the shared accountability. So I, I think they don't quite deliver uh, or go far enough in terms of the spirit of the Smith Commission, the spirit of the Smith Commission, such that this parliament, uh, and it should be for this parliament to have powers over railway policing, but also accountability. So uh, in terms of the models uh, that, that, that she's mentioned, um, the, the kind of UK wide governance structures and accountability structures would give me uh, some cause for concern, not just because of the Smith Commission, but also the potential uh, confusion that may well exist. So uh, while I say that they're, 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 they're nothing is, is off the table, I, I have some reservations, and I'll be open about those reservations, but if I can be convinced and persuaded uh, otherwise, I'm genuinely going into this with uh, as much of an open mind as I, I possibly can. The difficulty of being so open-minded, I think, from the committee's point of view this morning, uh, Cabinet Secretary, with no clear idea exactly what is on the table. And if there are problems with these modules, what the problems? Could you flush out some of that? And it may be that you would like to reflect on this and write to the committee with more specific uh, reasons why the administrative model of devolution, for example, doesn't quite uh, seem to be one that you can say, yes, I'll, I'll, I'll certainly put that as, in, as, a, as a possibility at this stage. And the same with the statutory devolved model of go governance and uh, accountability. Yes, indeed. And if the convener wouldn't mind, um, it would be my preference to get the stakeholders together to do some of this work to determine which path we're going to go down without prejudging. So I'm doing my best not to prejudge you. You've asked me a, a question on, 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 on if I have any reservations on those particular models. I've expressed where I have those reservations, but I'm not completely discounting them. And, and I, I'm, while, of course, you have every right to ask us for, 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 th for the thoughts and reflect on that, of course, I, I, I would do that if that is on the insistence uh, of, 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 of yourself and, and the committee. But I would really be reluctant to do anything that would look like I'm prejudging what will be an important discussion with the various stakeholders, including BTPA, BTP, BTPF. And I understand, others. Cabinet Secretary, there's a balance to be struck, but a little bit more data, I think, would be helpful. And can you tell the committee today when this consultation is starting, how long you think it's going to take? Uh, the conversations are, uh, are already beginning, and, and I'm looking to meet with stakeholders uh, very soon uh, on that. And, uh, and again, in my response to, to Sean Robison, um, the timeline would hopefully be able to come back to committee and indeed back to parliament, uh, certainly before Christmas recess, to give you uh, hopefully a definitive on the option that's been agreed by all partners. Now, we may not get to that point, and, and of course I'll keep you updated on that, but um, I'm trying to strike a balance between understanding that there is absolutely a time imperative uh, on, on this, but also making sure that um, we absolutely get to the best interim arrangement as possible. Okay. Supplementary, Daniel, and then Fulton. Thank you. I'm just wondering to what extent there's a time constraint in terms of finding a solution for this, given that railway policing is both delivered and funded uh, in accordance with PSA agreements uh, between rail operators and the British Transport Police, and therefore there's a natural contract cycle uh, that, 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 that will uh, accrue. I mean, I'm just wondering whether or not that provides a window of opportunity which requires to be met. Yeah, and there may well be. I mean, there's a, the, the, the contracts are done on a four yearly cycle uh, basis. Um, but as I said in my answer to, to the convener, uh, we are not wasting time and getting on with these conversations that have to be had. And I think a challenging time scale of settling on an option uh, uh, before Christmas recess uh, where possible. Um, so uh, I, I think the member's right to, to raise the, the, the time uh, challenge that we have uh, and the pressure that we have in relation to the timing. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, I have confidence that we'll get into a position to be able to give interim options, hopefully by the Christmas recess and, and, and pursue them and, and, and move along with them, as I say, at a, at a pace. So is the Cabinet Secretary aware of when that 
uh, four-year cycle is up and when they're due to renew the, the PSAs? Um, I, I'm not entirely sure. I don't know whether uh, Donna has information on, on, on I that. I don't know. Um, I don't have that information just now. From I don't have that information supplier. either at the top yeah. of my head, but uh, certainly uh, we have arrangements that are in place that have worked well for the railway industry, between the railway industry and, and, and BTP as things stand. Um, and if it was needed that uh, they, would, they would come to, to, to arrangements, to agreements, then they would be able to do that. Um, but as I say, I don't think it's such a time imperative that uh, should we get to a, a, an option of the direction of travel we want to go by Christmas recess, I think that would stand us in, in, in good enough stead. But if you missed that renewal point, you you need agreement from the operators to bring in new agreements. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. If, if we are creating new arrangements, we will have to negotiate with the railway operators anyway. And the break points are um, obviously set up for the arrangements with BTPA. So if arrangements are with another body, um, then it would be a new arrangement anyway. So we would need to enter into discussions about when that would start, the structure, the, um, the arrangements around that. So I think um, while the breakpoints are a, a useful timing um, to consider, it wouldn't preclude us um, doing um, that work at any other time. Um, but that would be a matter for negotiation with the railway operators at the time, if we were to do that. It would be helpful if you, you wrote to the committee with these renewal dates. Yes, that's possible. That. Thank you. Any other questions here? Fulton. Thanks, Convener. Can, can I just uh, express my sheer disappointment with the Cabinet Secretary? Um, obviously, on today's news um, and, and the process we're now going through, but also to give credit um, for taking the advice of Police Scotland, which is what you and your predecessor always said would be the case if they raised any concerns. If somebody had sat in this committee and spoken the debate, um, I was convinced, as was the majority of Parliament, that uh, full integration was the, the, the best move. Uh, but there was one particular specific area which you mentioned yourself, uh, Cabinet Secretary, which uh, struck out, and that was the ability of Police Scotland to train all officers um, in, in the railway area and allow then fast response um, to various situations that might arise. Can I get some reassurance that that um, won't be scrapped or lost in this interim period? And uh, do Police Scotland have any plans to continue on with that training facility? I, I don't know whether that would be uh, part of their plan because uh, my understanding was that that, uh, uh, that would be done upon full integration. But again, uh, you'll forgive me, I, I can't quite from the top of my head uh, pinpoint whether that was the case uh, or not. And again, I might refer back to, 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 to Donna on this. It does though, speak to the point I'm, I'm making around full integration and keeping it under review that the government, uh, just because we have taken the steps and, and taken the advice, of Police Scotland at this stage around not being able to give a definitive date for full integration doesn't mean that we no longer believe that there are benefits uh, of, of full integration. We do. Uh, and I've spoken to some of those around seamless policing and, and single command structures and uh, training, enhanced training and so on and so forth. So we still believe that that, that, that could be done, but clearly it would be um, foolish of us not to, to, to heed Police Scotland's advice. I don't know whether Donna has further information on the training aspect of it, because um, there's going to be an additional uh, couple of weeks kind of bolted on to the end of uh, training for, for police um, uh, recruits. But I, I don't know yeah. whether that will be um, And that was one of the work streams that was developed as part of the programme planning. So Police Scotland did a fair bit of work on training needs assessment, both for um, Police Scotland officers. I mean, it, you would get more... Um, specific information from them about that. Um, but a piece of work around training needs for all officers and also training needs for any um, officers <coughs> who are transferring from BTP to Police Scotland. So there is um, a, a, a piece of work which has been done that sets that out, which um, you know, Police Scotland could potentially um, share or if they were prepared to do that. Okay. Finally, um, Cabinet Secretary, I'm aware that there are representatives of the BTP in uh, the gallery and the, uh, in the audience today. So what reassurance can you give them and assurances uh, that their views will be fully uh, listened to and um, presumably acted upon? I've been heartened by, by, by the fact that um, the majority of those that you mentioned, if not all of them, have, uh, have welcomed 
the government uh, getting to this position around uh, pausing uh, the work on full integration, keeping it under review and so on, but, but focusing very much on, on, on interim uh, arrangements that I've also seen from them uh, a, a welcome uh, in terms of the tone we've taken in relation to bringing stakeholders together. So that gives me reassurance that our message is getting out to those stakeholders and I want to engage with them as soon as possible. A number of them I, I have meetings in, in, in the diary already set. Um, for, for those that haven't, uh, we will be speaking to them, I'm sure, and, 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 and relatively shortly. Um, so I can give them an absolute assurance. Uh, I can give them an assurance, uh, as I've said previously, that we absolutely value the expertise that their members have and hold, and that we also understand that there's still an element of uncertainty that it clearly exists until we come to those interim arrangements and potentially the long-term plan. And I'm cognizant of that and um, you know, where I can give comfort to that, uh, I'll do my best to do so. But as things stand, of course, right now, as of today, um, the, 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 the current uh, arrangements uh, stand uh, for, 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 for BTP, um, but uh, clearly, uh, if we're deciding on options before the Christmas recess, which I, I hope to do, the, the winter recess, which I hope to do, then um, we'll try to give as much certainty and as much information to officers and staff as we possibly can. Yeah, just to um, clarify, when you're consulting and, and you know, part of, of looking forward is, is consulting with uh, SPA, Police Scotland, will the, the representative, uh, representatives of BT officers and staff be involved at the same level as equal partners and do you have a date when you're actually going to meet with them given how germane they are to this whole um, this whole issue and process? Yes, I was just chatting to, to uh, Nigel Goodban and, uh, on my way in to, to committee. We have a date in the diary for meeting with the British Transport Police Federation, so there, um, and that'll be a personal meeting uh, that I'll be uh, conducting. So yes, uh, absolutely, that uh, their voices will be equal to any other stakeholder uh, very much in this process, and I look forward to hearing from them. As I said, uh, I know that uh, other stakeholders have come uh, forward with uh, other suggestions, other potential models. Um, some of those I, I have some reservations, but I'm, I'm happy to talk to them on those options, or indeed of any new options that, that might come from, from any other stakeholders. And the date is before the winter recess, the Christmas recess? Sorry? Yeah. The, the date is before the Christmas recess? Yes, the, yeah. the meeting date for, for, for sure, and the date that I'd hope to be able to, to give you uh, options that the partners have, have agreed on or settled on. If, if we get to a kind of consensus point, hopefully, uh, then I would hope to get that to you before Christmas recess also. OK, thank you very much. That's very reassuring. That in, uh, concludes you. our um, line of questioning. We now suspend briefly just to allow witnesses to leave. Agenda item three is four. <laughs> Time classic. Agenda item four is consideration of a negative instrument, Share of Court Fees Amendment Order 2018 SSI 2018 Oblique 194. I refer members to paper three, which is a note by the clerk. It also includes the Scottish Government's response to a concern raised by the committee that the original instrument had contained an error which allowed certain exemptions for the commissary um, fees. Do members have any comments? No comments? No. Uh, I think it was good to raise this and um, we are satisfied with the explanation. Is the, the committee therefore agreed that does not wish to make any recommendation in relation to this instrument? 
Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Agenda item five is an appointment of a European Union reporter. The committee has to nominate a member to act as the European reporter. And I refer members to paper four, which is a note by the clerk, and paragraph five of that paper outlines the role of the EU reporter. And um, can I have a nomination? John Finney. Thank you, MacArthur. Thank you. Are there any other nominations? That being the case, then I'm delighted to tell you, Liam, you are the, <laughs> the EU reporter for the Justice Committee. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, agenda item six is a feedback report for the meeting of the Justice Subcommittee on Policing on 13th of September. Following the verbal report, there will be an opportunity for brief comments or questions, and I refer members to paper five, which is noted by the clerk, and ask John Finney to provide this feedback. Excuse me. Thank you, Convener. Yeah, you rightly say that the last meeting was on the 13th of September last week, and on that occasion we took evidence from Police Scotland's regarding the proposed use of digital device triage systems. Now, these are more commonly referred to as cyber kiosks. Um, as well as Police Scotland, we had the Scottish Human Rights Commission and the Information Commissioner's Office provide us with evidence. And that evidence focused on the requirements and safeguards necessary prior to Police Scotland using this technology throughout Scotland to interrogate the mobile phones of witnesses and suspects. Um, and of course, the committee had previously expects concern that a trial had taken place without any of these protections. Uh, it, we welcome the fact that uh, Police Scotland has established two groups to consider and agree the human rights and equality impact assessments, data security, storage and retention policies, and the public information to be provided prior to the introduction and the training of officers. Um, now, we heard from the Scottish Human Rights Commission the significant <coughs> concerns they had about the draft versions of the human rights and equality impact assessments, and again, their concerns about trials being undertaken without any uh, being underpinned by any such assessments. A, pe a pressing concern expressed both by the Human Rights Commission and the Information Commissioner's Office was about the legality of Police Scotland seizing and interrogating the mobile phones of people accused of a crime or those who had witnessed a crime. And Police Scotland confirmed that if there is no legal basis for them to do so, then the rollout of cyber chaos currently planned for later this year will not proceed. Um, and this is an issue which the subcommittee will return to once the assessment policies, procedures and guidelines have been finalised and are publicly available and falls into some of the ongoing scrutiny arrangements we have with the inspectorate regarding related matters. And thank you for that comprehensive <coughs> report. Are there any comments? I'll just say I think it was a, an excellent session and there are certainly issues arising from that that need to be picked up and addressed. So, um, I think it was a good session, convener. Right, if there are no questions, that uh, concludes our uh, 23rd meeting of 2018. Our next meeting will be Tuesday, 25th of September, when we will continue our evidence taking on post legislative scrutiny of the Fire, uh, Police and Fire Reform Scotland Act 2012. So I now close this meeting. Convener. Sorry, Can I before just... we close. No, no. no. Afterwards. Ends closed. <laughs>